just uh, to introduce my uh, talk, I would like, probably it would be interesting for you, I don't know, but I think that when we speak about diplomacy, and uh, particularly about Russian diplomacy now, uh, just some words about uh, the main characteristics of Russian diplomacy because it's quite particular history of Russian diplomacy. And uh, uh, once, I, some years ago, I wrote a book about model of diplomacy, modern model, models of diplomacy. And uh, certainly today we have uh, such a modern model of diplomacy, which is uh, similar to other diplomatic services in the world. But uh, the history of uh, such evolution of Russian diplomacy was quite particular, and, uh, quite curious, I suppose. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, medieval Russia, when in Europe there was already uh, modern model of diplomacy, secular diplomacy, with its uh, permanent em embassies and uh, centers for foreign affairs and so on. In Russia, uh, the situation was quite uh, different because in Russia, uh, diplomacy was very uh, strictly linked to uh, the state. And uh, the state was based on uh, uh, rules and on the laws of Byzantium, uh, Byzantine Empire, because we got our orthodox uh, religion from uh, Byzantium. And in By uh, Byzantium, there was uh, the principle uh, for diplomacy also was a so-called symphony of powers, the symphony of powers. Uh, and uh, if you see now, for example, our state emblem, state symbol, uh, symbol, do you know what it is? You, you know our state symbol, state emblem? Do you know Russian? Double head eagle. Double head eagle. Why double head? Because one head is about secular power, about the emperor, and the other head was about, uh, about spiritual power, about patriarch. So this is the principle of symphony which was uh, just uh, the main characteristic also of Russian medieval diplomacy. And uh, it uh, brought to such a missionary vision of uh, the role of Russia. Moscow were considered uh, themselves uh, to be the third Rome, the biggest Orthodox country. And uh, that's why uh, Moscow didn't have a number of diplomatic relations. Uh, the countries, only with countries with whom diplomatic relations were needed, and those with whom uh, they weren't uh, needed, they were needless, they were denied uh, the honor of diplomatic relations with Moscow. So uh, that was the main characteristic of the medieval Russian diplomacy, but uh, destroyed uh, absolutely by uh, reforms of Peter the Great in the late, uh, in the early uh, 18th century. He abolished uh, the patriarch institution and uh, following the example of Protestant states, he made himself head of the Russian church and uh, subordinated it to the state synod. And uh, only with Peter the Great, the birth uh, of the temporal sovereignty concept uh, 
appeared in Russia. And uh, so just uh, from that period, we got a very modern model of diplomacy and uh, a vast network of uh, permanent Russian ambassadors appeared uh, in uh, many, many European countries and uh, Asian countries and so on and so on and so forth. Then with time, uh, with time, uh, uh, in uh, 1802, appeared Ministry of Foreign Affairs, modern Ministry of Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs. And uh, it existed uh, in such uh, style until uh, the February Revolution of 1917 in Russia, uh, when for example, the changes were very serious and very important because before Russian diplomats couldn't uh, take part in political parties and so on, but with the February Revolution, they could take part uh, in parties and uh, just <clears throat> do their activities in uh, political life of that period. But in October 1917, everything changed again. And there was a Bolshevik revolution and uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs was uh, replaced by uh, People's uh, Commissariat for Foreign Affairs. People's Con and uh, uh, the idea was uh, just quite different because uh, it was Bolshevik revolution and uh, uh, the uh, message was that the, uh, the Bolshevik revolution will be followed by a world socialist revolution. Moscow wasn't uh, uh, more the third Rome, but was at the center of the third communist international. And also such missionary vision was uh, belonged to uh, Bolshevik and Bolshevik diplomacy as well. Uh, then I should say that uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, be got uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. So uh, just such uh, interesting history of Russian diplomacy, uh, we must take in consideration when we speak about our diplom our today diplomacy. And uh, when we speak uh, about our today diplomacy, uh, certainly, I, as far as I understand, today we will speak about public diplomacy and uh, its tools. And uh, I should say that uh, we used uh, to consider public diplomacy as a term is a fairly new aspect of traditional diplomacy. And uh, uh, certainly uh, it's uh, quite a new aspect of traditional diplomacy, but it evolves uh, uh, very, very quickly. That's why many researchers now speak about uh, public diplomacy as the general diplomacy, that all tools of diplomacy now uh, can be characterized as a public, uh, tools of public diplomacy. It's uh, quite a broad concept uh, that uh, to a certain extent, we can say that our diplomacy became a part of public diplomacy. Uh, certainly, 
public diplomacy, Russian public diplomacy presupposes various ways of implementing foreign policy. In Russia, for example, in accordance with our constitution, the president of the Russian Federation has become the main and practically the only subject of foreign policy. So he uses his own diplomacy, so to say, his own public diplomacy also. And uh, when we talk about the definitions of public diplomacy, certainly most often we mean that it is part of the policy of soft power. And um, it's rather difficult to draw a watershed between soft power and public diplomacy. Uh, yes, and uh, so now in the world arena, a plurality of actors appeared. And uh, I just try always to divide uh, public diplomacy in two parts. One part is uh, official public diplomacy uh, brought by Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> represent the representations abroad and uh, or other state uh, uh, bodies. As uh, I told you, president, uh, his administration, or other state bodies, ministries, and so on. And uh, the second part is uh, non-official public diplomacy, diplomacy of uh, non-governmental organizations, first of all, or individuals also. And uh, certainly I would say uh, that now many um, researchers speak also of so-called transformational diplomacy. But the term was introduced many years ago by the uh, Secretary of State uh, Department uh, in the US, Condoleezza Rice, such definition of transformational diplomacy. But yes, I think that public diplomacy today, today's public diplomacy differs uh, from traditional diplomacy because its main goal consists in seeking uh, to change something in the surrounding world and uh, to obtain uh, uh, evolution of uh, very difficult situation, for example, of, uh, of the present days and uh, uh, just to overcome some difficulties and so on. So such uh, transformational diplomacy could be uh, very advantageous. Uh, well, I think that uh, I can speak uh, a lot about diplomacy and its uh, different uh, uh, aspects and so on, but probably uh, I would like to uh, uh, listen to your questions and uh, something that you are interested in. Uh, please uh, come up with questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zonova. Uh, I would like, uh, just as moderator, uh, to, uh, to ask you a first uh, uh, question. Uh, recently, uh, we discussed uh, at our online platform uh, the challenges uh, of uh, diplomacy, the new challenges of diplomacy. And uh, one uh, of our experts, uh, he, uh, he said that uh, nowadays uh, there, uh, there is a new challenge that uh, there are many uh, different structures like ministries of foreign affairs uh, acting uh, in the field of diplomacy, but many times uh, presidents uh, they uh, communicate so fast among each other uh, 
uh, without uh, any um, borders or limits uh, due to uh, online uh, conversations and so on. So uh, what, what do you think? What is uh, uh, exactly the, the future of diplomacy? Are there going to be some transformations or we can still be sure that uh, kind of classic diplomacy will stay? Yeah. But certainly uh, it will um, change and uh, there will be other forms of diplomacy in the future, absolutely, because uh, the world is now quite different with all its technological developments and possibilities uh, to exchange opinions and uh, to take decisions and so on. Uh, yes, you speak, uh, for example, you uh, said that uh, presidents just uh, uh, take now a very important uh, role in diplomacy. That's uh, true because I remember uh, that uh, traditional diplomats were shocked when such uh, summit diplomacy uh, start, started because it was sometimes uh, presidents just uh, uh, can express uh, very unusual uh, positions and uh, not prepared before by diplomatic staff and so on. And then they didn't know what to do with such de uh, declaration, with, uh, with such statements made by uh, the presidents uh, during their meeting. So yes, uh, certainly summit diplomacy is a quite new form of diplomacy. And uh, we must just uh, take in consideration such new forms also. Or um, high technologies, for example, uh, there appeared such a term as um, triplomacy, just diplomacy based on Twitter, on such exchange of uh, uh, replics of uh, messages in Twitter in just very immediate reaction and so on. Diplomacy and uh, diplomats, uh, just as a new form of diplomats. Uh, yes, certainly many, many problems there are, but Sometimes uh, there are people who speak about uh, so-called crisis of diplomacy, new crisis of diplomacy, in a sense, because, for example, uh, I can uh, cite now two well-known crises of diplomacy, because the first one was um, during the Great War, and after the Great War, because diplomacy was uh, uh, accused of uh, its uh, impossibility to prevent the war, because the main goal of diplomacy, as we know it, is uh, to maintain peace. But uh, there was a war and uh, there were critics of diplomacy and they said that uh, we spend a lot of money because diplomacy is a quite expensive structure. So we spend money on diplomacy, but uh, they uh, are unable to do something, doing something uh, important just uh, in order to prevent uh, war. So it was the first crisis of diplomacy and then followed different reforms in diplomacy. Really, just for example, women uh, could become diplomats after the Great War. Uh, then um, just uh, uh, competitions just to uh, be uh, assumed as uh, diplomats, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, such competitions. So they opened doors for different uh, um, representative of different uh, um, straits of uh, population, just very simple people, but well prepared, could 
just uh, try to become diplomats and so on, not only aristocratic uh, representatives uh, as it was before. And the second crisis of diplomacy was uh, certainly during the, the Second World War because uh, again, uh, diplomats were uh, blamed for their um, ability to prevent war. And uh, certainly uh, there are um, other difficulties because, for example, when we speak about public diplomacy, we just uh, remember uh, the so-called open diplomacy, the term of open diplomacy. Um, it appeared in 19, 17 and 18, because uh, the first was the October Revolution in Russia and Bolsheviks uh, uh, decrees. They proclaimed open diplomacy just no secrets, uh, but everything must be uh, must be open to a large uh, public opinion and so on, all foreign policy and so on. And uh, then in 1918, uh, President uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, of the United States, uh, he proclaimed his famous 14 positions about also about uh, so so called open diplomacy and my uh, opinion is that uh, such position yes it was quite a democratic position yes everybody can participate in discussions and just uh, be aware of a new uh, foreign of new courses in foreign policy and so on. But at the same time, I am sure that such open system, a diplomatic system with the participation of mass media in discussing diplomatic decisions and foreign policy, it just reduced the role of diplomacy in itself and uh, just some very confident and secret operation uh, was, uh, weren't more uh, just uh, done by, uh, made by uh, diplomats, but uh, by secret services. And that's why we see that uh, secret services um, began to develop uh, and uh, to uh, transform in very um, powerful organizations. So uh, such problems of diplomacy, certainly we have such problems of diplomacy now. And uh, we will see how it will be possible to to uh, go uh, further with such uh, um, speed development of uh, technologies. Now, I remember I wrote a comment uh, about such problems and I cited um, just uh, the uh, statement of one of the diplomat uh, and he said that uh, probably now we can't uh, just spend so many uh, resources and uh, spend money to uh, conserve our secrets, uh, our confidential uh, decisions in diplomacy. Because there are hackers, there are other tools just to, or oh, somebody will sell you some secrets if you pay a lot of money and so on. And he proposed not to spend money on uh, such secret uh, codes and uh, uh, machineries and so on. 
And he said, uh, let's just uh, uh, behave as, uh, uh, um, as for example, uh, supermarkets uh, do, because they just, uh, instead of uh, spending money on um, such uh, cameras and uh, uh, guards and so on, they just, uh, uh, at the very beginning, just uh, count uh, a sum of money uh, uh, which will uh, on products on um, products uh, which uh, would be uh, stolen and so he proposed to do the same in diplomacy just not to spend a lot of money but um, to be more open and uh, without uh, any uh, serious secrets. Uh, so the discussion is underway about uh, tools of diplomacy and how to uh, accept such uh, changes in our life and uh, in technologies and so on. Uh, yes, it's a big uh, story, but uh, all, for example, with uh, after the, Second World War, our ministries of foreign affairs or our representatives abroad, uh, I speak about all the world, they became a very uh, large organizations. For example, some embassies of very important, uh, of the very important uh, countries, uh, some embassies became uh, uh, small ministries because uh, the staff was enormous and uh, and it was uh, certainly after the Second World War when the Cold War, uh, during all the period of Cold War, uh, a lot of uh, problems and a lot of uh, even uh, uh, spies uh, which uh, utilized the embassies as uh, their uh, roof, I should say, uh, just with uh, their diplomatic passports and so on. But now many researchers, many scholars uh, speak about the necessity to reduce the number bureaucratic number of uh, 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 diplomatic representations and ministries, but just to concentrate on the very efficient group of people uh, with analytical uh, capacities, with analytical capacities is very important because uh, all the rest, uh, uh, collect, for example, collect information and send information to the uh, capitals, to the center. It's not so necessary now because with internet, we can collect information just without your uh, representatives abroad. So, and just you spare money and uh, uh, efforts. So there are a lot of uh, different problems. Or oh, there are people who uh, say that, for example, uh, we must have uh, diplomatic representations in uh, different uh, cities of the country, not only in the capital, but small representations in uh, most uh, important city of the country. It's another story, yes? You can choose also such a way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, there are many other, yes, many other mm -hmm. uh, proposals now about transformation of diplomacy and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your... Um... Uh, for your answer. And uh, I would like uh, to give uh, the floor to one of the participants who wrote uh, his question, but maybe he would like to address it by himself. Uh, Rustam Baratov, please. We can't hear you, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, you hear me right now? Yes. Um, Tatiana Zanova, спасибо большое за ваш адрес. Очень интересный um, um, conversation. Um, I'll just continue in English. Um, so the question about, you know, you've done a lot of uh, your research and coursework on modern diplomacy in the 21st century, maybe in the future as well. Um, what is your opinion on the involvement of NGOs um, in diplomacy? You know, right now uh, with COVID, uh, we've seen a lot of participation uh, because of the nature and a lot of people have been able to participate um, with, you know, like being non-diplomatic, for example, as you use. Um, and, you know, the United Nations and, you know, back then the League of Nations, they started to invite NGOs and external um, stakeholders to participate. Um, whom most of them right now are in consultative status. Um, so what would you say that we will see in future uh, in terms of modern diplomacy, like even the transformation of diplomacy or the urban diplomacy, as you've mentioned um, in your address? Yes, thank you for your very interesting question because uh, really such non-government organization uh, are very, important now in diplomacy because with uh, such democratization of diplomacy and uh, the involvement of public opinion in uh, diplomatic discussions of, on uh, foreign policy they are very very important i remember that once i wrote a comment uh, entitled um, non-governmental organizations are an instrument of trust or an agent of influence because there are different approach towards the problem of uh, non-governmental organization and uh, just now we have on the world uh, uh, scene we have a lot uh, on the world stage we have a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations. There are very big one, uh, for example, as Greenpeace and other uh, very important uh, non-governmental organization. And there are uh, quite small non-governmental organizations, but very active. Uh, for example, in Russia, we have uh, now a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations uh, just involved in uh, foreign policy problems. And uh, just uh, there are, if I don't mistake, there are 62 non-governmental organizations uh, recognized uh, having a, a consultative status with the uh, United Nations, with the COSOS of the United Nations. So there are a lot of such organizations and uh, very important organization. Uh, um, certainly, uh, the classical model of diplo diplomacy suggesting the interaction uh, only between states. Uh, now it's only one of the aspects of uh, diplomacy uh, because uh, now diplomacy is quite multifaceted. Uh, just such organizations are very important. And uh, I just uh, wrote about uh, the term because how you translate, for example, in Russian, the term public diplomacy. There was a discussion because somebody, um, some people tried to translate it as um, people's diplomacy. And I am against such a term because it is, uh, uh, it was quite uh, uh, adopted during the Soviet regime, such people's uh, diplomacy. Uh, but uh, just the meaning of public diplomacy now is quite different. So I prefer call uh, such organizations as public diplomacy, involved in public diplomacy. 
not in people's diplomacy. Uh, yeah. Thank, th th thank you very much. Uh, following the, the public diplomacy, we also have a question from uh, uh, Bruno, please. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I suppose so. Uh, my name is Bruno Rukavina. I am from Zagreb, Croatia, and I have a question about public diplomacy and specifically about Russian public diplomacy. So what are the limits of Russian public diplomacy in other states? What are the main challenges, challenges that Russian diplomats face abroad or on terrain when they are implementing Russian public diplomacy? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, you know that uh, I should uh, um, uh, speak uh, not about uh, um, difficulties of Russian public diplomacy, but it's uh, quite a political problem. Uh, because uh, when you politicize uh, such relations between state and uh, between, between states or between peoples, and you try to ideologize the, such relations. Uh, certainly for public diplomacy, it's not very um, advantageous uh, situation. And uh, I think it's uh, the same, not only for Russian public diplomacy, but for the public diplomacy also of other states. Uh, so that's why you must uh, just uh, develop uh, such uh, direction of uh, diplomacy with caution and just try not to ideologize it or politicize it. Uh, uh, I think that uh, um, now the situation you know, on the world stage is quite uh, mm, difficult because of pandem pandemic, because of uh, tensions between West and East and uh, so on. So I hope that public diplomacy uh, can uh, play a very positive uh, role in uh, just in trying to uh, improve such situation, trying to do something, uh, just people, uh, just uh, eliminating uh, suspicions and uh, um, some prejudices is existing between peoples and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And uh, following uh, this, uh, uh, question, I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, Bianca, and yeah. then uh, we will go to another question about the United Nations. Good afternoon, Professor Zorba. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my question is about, mm, I would like to ask Professor Zorba about uh, her opinion about the main differences and the main I'm sorry, but, uh, I in the way of considering public you. diplomacy. In a, just repeat, please, because um, sorry, it was Adam. with the sound. Uh, can you hear me now? Now, yes. Yes, I can hear you. All right, I'm sorry. Doesn't. All right. Um, my name is Bianca Maria Tarditi, and I would like to ask you what are, in your opinion, what are the main similarities and differences in the way of considering public diplomacy in Russia and in the European Union? So, because we know that, of course, uh, the uh, diplomacy of European Union is quite young. Uh, so, what are what what would you say are the main uh, characteristics uh, of the of the of the European Union diplomacy comparing with the um, with the Russian the way of considering Russian public diplomacy? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, certainly. I, uh, I should say that for our uh, diplomacy, the example of the European Union public diplomacy is very important. Uh, 
because now uh, the European Union um, developed its public diplomacy quite uh, uh, successfully and uh, I suppose that uh, they just uh, elaborated a program of their public diplomacy, They're very, very interesting and efficient, and just trying to uh, spread their values and uh, their principles, uh, principles of uh, the organization of the European Union and preparing new candidates uh, to the access uh, to the European Union and so on. So uh, just in this uh, sense, I suppose that we must just uh, mm, render more efficient our public diplomacy abroad also, and uh, just not be so suspicious uh, as we are sometimes uh, towards uh, our uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, which now, for example, you know, and you read about it, uh, uh, some of them are considered to be foreign agents and so on. And uh, I think that uh, it was uh, the example of the United States of America when in the United States of America, you know, just in the 30s uh, of the uh, last uh, century, they uh, introduced such uh, term as uh, foreign agents and some non-governmental organizations or some the individuals uh, had to register as foreign agents. And uh, the same uh, just in Russia, some uh, non-governmental organizations, if they um, got uh, if they got money from abroad, they must register as foreign agents. I wasn't very happy with such a definition because I think that um, we had uh, different laws and uh, quite uh, developed legislation just to control such uh, uh, flows of money and so on. But uh, such a law uh, just uh, puts uh, a lot of problems because how to uh, understand if it was necessary to uh, have such uh, money from abroad because, for example, you have uh, your uh, partners uh, abroad and uh, you just try to establish uh, I don't know, something very important or very important platform for discussions and so on. How can you not to receive money or not to spend, to send money abroad and so on. So it's uh, very, um, I think it's quite a, a strange act of our legislation just to introduce such term of uh, foreign agents. But nevertheless, I am sure that uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, such important non-governmental organization and they work with the United Nations and they work also abroad and so on. And I think that uh, they will overcome such difficulties and uh, they will be um, efficient. Uh, nevertheless. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zono. And uh, following the issue of the United Nations, I would like to give the floor to uh, Augustine. Please, please introduce thank you. yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Augustine. I'm a, I'm a student in public relations in Belgium. And you'll have to apologize for the quality of my webcam, but I'm not a ghost. Um, anyways, so. So yeah, I would like um, to have your your opinion about uh, the vision that uh, the Russian Federation has um, about the future of the Security Council uh, of the United Nations, because we have seen over the last few years that 
uh, there's been some individuals that uh, have, uh, well, don't really believe in multilateralism and uh, what, what is the vision of, of Russian Federation in terms of reforms, etc. Thanks. Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, it's a very important question about uh, the Security Council of uh, the United Nations and uh, about uh, the reform of the United Nations, because just for many, many years we um, speak about uh, such uh, reform of the United Nations because uh, just uh, United Nation, the United Nations uh, uh, appeared in 1945, so many, many years uh, passed after such event. So now the life uh, changed a lot, and so the situation uh, in the world arena is different and so on. So we spoke about such uh, necessity of uh, reform of the United Nations to modernize the United Nations. Uh, from uh, the one, on the one part, it's absolutely necessary to have such an international organizations because now, our global problems uh, are so important and we must discuss uh, such problems together with the participation of all the countries of the world. So as the organization, it's very important organization, but uh, certainly it needs uh, some reforms just to modernize such organization. As to the Security Council, also we speak about the Security Council and the possible reform of the Security Council. We know, for example, that now there are many countries or regions uh, which pretends to uh, to take part at the Security Council. For example, uh, African countries or Latin American countries or India uh, and uh, even Japan and uh, Germany, they pretend to be part of uh, the Security Council of the United Nations. And uh, certainly it's very important uh, just to take in consideration their uh, request because uh, they are very important in the modern life and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, the problem today is uh, because there is a tension between East and West, between Russia and the Western, some Western countries uh, or organizations and so on. And uh, uh, for Russia, uh, uh, the problem of uh, the veto in the Security Council uh, appears very important, as it is for China, for example, for the, the People's Republic of China, the veto, to have the veto in the Security Council, it's a very important point because if not, uh, many, many resolutions can be taken just without their consents. So how to, uh, to solve, to, to find a solution of such a situation? It's a problem, but it's a problem of negoci negotiations. And uh, certainly sometimes when everybody needs uh, a new resolution of the United Nations of the Security Council. Uh, such resolutions, very important and topical resolution, uh, resolutions can be vetoed or by uh, Western countries or by uh, Russia and China. Uh, so sometimes it's quite a deadlock. That's why we need negotiation about um, such problems, how to modernize the uh, Security Council, but uh, solving such problem of the veto inside of the Security Council. 
And it depends, uh, on my opinion, it depends uh, on the uh, developing of the evolution of the situation uh, on the world, uh, uh, in the world arena, because uh, uh, when there are so, uh, so uh, tough, uh, controversial differences between uh, parties, uh, it's quite uh, quite difficult to try a needed uh, solution. But we hope that just uh, we will overcome such uh, difficult situation uh, with our controversial with uh, West countries uh, values problems and so on. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zonova. And now, uh, Ronald, please. Hello. Thank you, Professor Zonova. Thank you for your presentation. I have, uh, in fact, uh, more like a comment question on the... On the if you could also introduce yourself, please. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry. Uh, I am Ronald Terrazas Mayea. I am from Bolivia. Now I'm doing my postdoc in engineering and in, um, biotechnology, let's say. And um, my question would be related to your comment about um, this idea that diplomats should disclose more information instead of spending so much money on cybersecurity or protecting from hackers, from hackers. In fact, I was interested in that theory because I read another article that came so so to the same conclusion, but from a different point of view, it was more coming that with the rise of social media, like everybody knows everything, you cannot hide positions, even public positions. Uh, they were saying that in the future, people is looking more for authenticity. They, they, they think diplomats are fake. And in fact, that was one of the reasons he said Trump won so easily against Hillary Clinton. So in fact, he came to a pretty interesting conclusion that people should be more authentic. And two, that maybe in the future, the diplomat politicians of the future will be very different. They would look more like uh, influencers, in fact. I don't know if you have talked about this. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question, but uh, I share with you your opinion, just in a sense, because certainly uh, just uh, it's not about uh, the diplomacy is not about uh, secrets, but it's about uh, dialogue, first of all, about dialogue and uh, constructing, constructing, building bridges, as they say, you know. It's about this, not about uh, secrecy. That's why I, I share such opinion, just that in the future, probably it wouldn't be such problems of uh, secrecy, but about uh, more open dialogue uh, between peoples and uh, states and uh, officials and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now, Olio, please. Yes, um, uh, do uh, um, I, I am Oli Kotro. I work uh, in the European Parliament um, as a parliamentary advisor. And I would like to ask one question. Um, taking into consideration that EU countries are so different economically, geographically, and geopolitically, how does it impact the EU public diplomacy in your view? impact of what? Uh, the, 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 the diplomacy, the, the, the how the EU presents uh, uh, its case, how it, the EU public diplomacy works, because if you think that we are 27 countries and, and, and they are so different, uh, uh, how, how does the fact that the countries are so different impact the way the EU public diplomacy works and how uh, we see the EU public diplomacy in third countries? Ah, I see. I see, yes. Uh, but you know that, uh, for example, uh, we know well that uh, the, the first goal of uh, the European integration when it uh, started in the 50s was to, uh, uh, to maintain peace because uh, to was uh, started from the European continent. That's why after the Second World War, the countries decided to 
uh, go towards uh, supranational organization just to prevent wars between European countries. And uh, now, for example, we have such a very interesting structure of the European Union because it functions, as I understand, at two levels, a supranational level and uh, intergovernmental level. And there are institutions for supranational uh, uh, relations and intergovernmental relations. That's why I don't think that uh, there are a lot of problems uh, with uh, such uh, public diplomacy inside the European Union. But uh, when they go to the third countries with their uh, embassies abroad, for example, they consider that their embassies are very efficient in public diplomacy. Why? Because they are composed of different people and different uh, nations. So uh, different religions also are presented in such embassies, European embassies abroad. That's why they are sure that it's uh, uh, more simple to connect, to communicate with, for example, in a country where there is a conflict, a religious conflict or ethnic conflict and so on. And the embassies with their structure, which comprise different people, are more efficient in negotiating some problems. That's why I think, uh, yes, they are right, uh, because it's uh, just uh, they um, could uh, demonstrate it uh, many, many times uh, with the efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof uh, Professor Zonova. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Thomas, please. Um, greetings. Um, I'm Thomas Wissage. I'm a freelance journalist. And I had a question that actually goes along the lines of what Ronald uh, asked before uh, about the impact of social media on modern diplomacy. Um, as a journalist, I know that uh, social media impacted deeply uh, my profession and that nowadays almost anybody can have an opinion and anybody can represent a country in the eyes of the others. And social media movements, especially large ones, can have diplomatic effects as well. So I was wondering how are modern diplomats uh, seeing um, social media now? Is it like a positive tool or is it more of a nuisance? Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, but I think that uh, diplomats now uh, can't uh, uh, ignore the existence of social media absolutely impossible because it's our everyday life and so we use such uh, social media networks and so on and uh, certainly there are some uh, diplomats uh, very traditional diplomats uh, they are against uh, the use of such media but I think, uh, for example, as uh, to our Minister of Foreign Affairs, we have uh, the uh, head of our Department for Information, um, uh, Maria Zakharova. Uh, I think you saw her here and uh, you know her. And uh, she spoke uh, about the necessity of using social media and she uses social media very actively as uh, many many our embassies now our ambassadors uh, use uh, social media just to express their position on different problems and the minister of foreign affairs of russia is uh, with maria zakharova uh, they use it uh, always. And uh, she just uh, say that, for example, when she speak uh, 
before the audience uh, in the ministry, before, um, during the press conference, her style is different, very serious. Uh, but when uh, she uh, uses uh, such, uh, for example, uh, Facebook or Twitter, uh, she says that we must be uh, use more sense of humor and uh, be very uh, more open. Uh, just with expressing our um, our uh, ideas and so on. And I think that uh, she is right, absolutely. It's necessary now to take in consideration the existence of such tools. But uh, certainly we, uh, the only thing is not to overcome some limits, because sometimes, as we saw just recently, some politicians just uh, just start to use very uh, tough expressions, and uh, I am against such a style. But uh, if you use it uh, well, why not? Uh, thank you very much. And there is a question from Christina. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Christina Soroka. I'm from St. Petersburg State University. And my question concerns uh, the perception of the public diplomacy on the official level of Russia. Uh, so as we know that um, there is no notion of public diplomacy in the present concept of uh, the Russian foreign diplomacy that was uh, that was adopted in 2016, uh, whereas uh, the concept of uh, 2013 uh, coined a term of uh, soft power. And so um, uh, my question is, uh, is it necessary to change the way uh, of the perception of the public diplomacy on the official level and uh, in particular to change, to, to coin the term of public diplomacy in the concept of the foreign uh, of the foreign policy of Russia, as it is the main document of the Russian foreign policy. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for your question. But um, you see, I uh, don't think we must change our uh, attitude towards uh, official documents of uh, which uh, speak about uh, public diplomacy because as we know, just uh, uh, for example, um, President Putin, uh, just in uh, 2012, he spoke uh, already about public diplomacy, why not? Yes, it was quite uh, accepted term. And uh, then um, we saw such a term in uh, the concept of, uh, of our foreign policy in uh, 2013 and uh, then in 2016 there was a, a, a renovated um, foreign policy concept uh, of Russia and uh, we find the soft power term and so on. Uh, so there is no there is no problem about uh, such terms and about such uh, significance of uh, public diplomacy and soft power policy. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And uh, actually, there is also a, a question, uh, I guess, uh, to the Russian sense, uh, sorry, the Russian house, sorry, uh, with a new name. Um, Madam Bunina, if uh, you are here with us. Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, so there was a question uh, about the role of uh, Russian House uh, in uh, in diplomacy. Uh, is it also does it also have diplomatic uh, status? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, certainly. My opinion is that uh, certainly it's a kind of diplomacy. Uh, Russian house, yes, it's a uh, public diplomacy of Russia, and it's quite uh, official 
public diplomacy of uh, such center because uh, uh, it's uh, part of Rosso Trudnicistva and uh, Rosso Trudnicistva, as we know, was just uh, set uh, uh, in the early uh, 21st century and uh, but uh, now it's a very important uh, center for public diplomacy and uh, uh, I don't uh, remember well the number uh, of uh, I suppose it's about uh, 80 or more different uh, centers for science and culture in different uh, countries of the world and uh, so it's important it's very important role uh, for public diplomacy uh, of Rosa Trudnicistva. And uh, it's not the case that uh, Rosa Trudnicistva is uh, subordinated to the president of the Russian Federation. And uh, it functions uh, inside uh, in the framework of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia. And uh, I think that um, uh, now, as I uh, knew recently, the new head of Rosso Trudnicistva, uh, uh, Evgeny Primakov, he decided to reform Rosso Trudnicistva and uh, to modernize also Rosa Trudnicistva, uh, first of all, changing the name. So, but uh, he asked just a competition to organize a competition with propo different proposals of the name. So there will be such a discussion about the new name of the Rosa Trudnicistva. And uh, uh, then other, other reforms uh, just in order to modernize uh, its uh, structure or its uh, staff and so on. Thank you, Professor uh, Zonova, for your uh, answer to the question. Uh, I guess it's uh, almost complete, but I would like to add something. Uh, really, our federal agency, Rosatrudnicistva, exists uh, for 95 years already. And it changed the name uh, on different uh, occasions. But now, really, we are, <clears throat> we are remaining, uh, the whole global structure is named uh, agency. And Russian Science for uh, Culture, uh, Russian Center for Science and Culture, different uh, countries uh, are renamed as Russian houses. And so now we are a uh, Russian house in Brussels, but it, uh, it's only a, a communicational name. Our official name remains uh, Russian Science for um, uh, Russian Center for Science and Culture. Uh, it's first um, addition to your answer. Uh, the second uh, thing I would like to to, to add is to that um, we are a cultural and educational institution, as uh, a lot of other uh, cultural and uh, educational and humanitarian institutions of other countries in the world. Our, our, our agency is an homolog of uh, um, Alliance Francaise, Institute of Cervantes, uh, Goethe Institute. Uh, British Council, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are, uh, we are working in the framework of this big uh, global, uh, national but international uh, agencies and structures. Um, our aim of all us is uh, uh, to promote the cooperation between our people, nations, countries, cultures educational systems, etc. So uh, we are working um, with our colleagues from other big structures, our other big agencies um, that I mentioned already. Um, and we have the same objectives, the same aims, uh, which are the international 
humanitarian, cultural, educational cooperation. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, observations. Uh, yes, I would like to add uh, something too, because uh, the very important goal, as I understand, of our Rosotrudnichstva now and other uh, our state bodies uh, is uh, about uh, uh, young people, because uh, a lot of uh, attention now is. Uh, uh, to the young people, to new generation. Uh, that's why, for example, uh, there is a goal to uh, increase uh, the number of foreign students in Russia and the Russian students abroad. That's a very important uh, decision and uh, there will be uh, such uh, such uh, financing uh, from the uh, state uh, budget uh, of such uh, uh, acts uh, just to prepare new uh, new world leaders to uh, to give uh, to young people possibility to study and to connect uh, between them and uh, to understand well uh, the situation in other countries and uh, just to bring forward such a dialogue between peoples, yes. Yes, you're Something. right. <clears throat> well, as we <clears throat> are teaching languages, we have Russian courses uh, at our center uh, and we have courses uh, in, in uh, normal <laughs> format, uh, but now uh, it's all online. And we have a lot of uh, programs and projects uh, for young people. It's absolutely normal that we are uh, working for increasing the number of uh, the uh, foreign students in Russia and uh, Russian uh, students abroad as other, uh, our colleagues from other countries, because uh, the Erasmus program of uh, the European Union is the same, uh, uh, has the same aims. And we are very happy that with the, the pandemic, <coughs> this uh, desire, this uh, uh, objective of studying abroad uh, remains. And uh, uh, this year we have several uh, European students that um, uh, make an application for studying in Russia. And last year in the uh, lockdown, very strong lockdown conditions, we had also several students who are studying in Russian universities online, but they will uh, uh, get their normal uh, diplomas and normal certificates. So they are studying online, but their diploma are real, not online. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, it's very important that studying and teaching remains a, a tool of maintaining their normal life, if you want. And uh, it concerns um, young people, but not only the young people, uh, everybody who wants to learn. Yes, certainly. Yeah, I just uh, say that our university, Gimo University, we have a lot of agreements with different universities abroad and we have double um, uh, master courses and uh, double diplomas and so on. That's very, very important, certainly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we uh, also have some questions. We're a bit already limited in time, but still, uh, Maurice, please. Thank you. Um, also, thank you to you, uh, the Professor Rizanova. It's been very interesting so far. Um, I was wondering uh, about the following. Would you say that Russian foreign policy is more closely linked with the office of the president compared to European countries such as Germany and France? I see. associated with the ministries of, of foreign affairs and if this is the case not just a, a perception how do you see this affecting foreign policy positively or negatively 
Oh, thank you for your question, but um, I can't uh, say that uh, if it's negative or positive, uh, it's not uh, the problem, I suppose, but the problem is about uh, constitutions of different countries. For example, if you take uh, Russia, so I told you that uh, the main uh, subject of foreign policy is our president. He is responsible for uh, the foreign policy uh, of Russia. And uh, uh, it's our constitution of, 90, of uh, 1993. And uh, uh, if we speak about Germany, for example, in Germany, as far as I know, uh, the role of uh, the president uh, is not very important because uh, uh, more important is the role of the chancellor of Germany. While in France, uh, another constitution, Fra a French constitution, uh, presupposes uh, the very important role of the president. So it depends of the, uh, of the constitutions of different countries. It's not positive or negative. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And now, uh, Victoria, please. Thank you so much. Спасибо большое за ваша конференция. Um, uh, my name is Victoria Musawi. I'm a student at the University of Brussels. And my question is a more a specific question regarding the context, uh, actual, the context actually the context of Russia. Uh, in what way do public statements by leaders uh, such as Joe Biden's statements on President Putin's policies, declaring him a murderer have an impact on public diplomacy? Or is it a form of extreme sarcasm that is not taken into account by public diplomacy in Russia? Thank you. you see, but uh, you see, I just uh, told you that I'm against uh, such tough um, statements uh, um, on the world uh, stage. But uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, our President Putin took it uh, with uh, quite a, a sense of humor and he answered very well to uh, Biden uh, just with a <laughs> sense of humor. And I think that um, we are not absolutely against our good relations with the United States or with the European Union, but uh, we must overcome such, uh, such uh, difficult uh, stage of our relations. But we are very interested uh, in developing uh, relations with the Western states and uh, the United States and the European Union. And uh, President Putin uh, told, uh, he spoke about it many times, that we are, remain very interested in developing relations. We are, we are against such prejudice and such the, uh, several decisions very, uh, very strange, for example, with this, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, pipeline uh, uh, with uh, Nord 2 and so on. Uh, but uh, we are absolutely quite well uh, disposed just to develop our relations. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, there are still uh, questions. Uh, one from uh, uh, one participant uh, who is not able to ask by himself, so he asked me to address it from Fabienne. So uh, he was interested to hear your opinion about different files where Europe and Russia are not on the same line. Uh, he's wondering if Russia has partic uh, particular expectations uh, towards Europe and who Russia and Europe 
can achieve this cooperation and probably how? I see. Uh, you see that uh, we had uh, just uh, a very good cooperation with the European Union for many years. And we had uh, the treaty of our cooperation and many negotiations, many platforms for negotiations and so on. I think it was about 18 platform, different platforms for negotiations and discussing very many problems and uh, energetic uh, problem uh, very important in our relations and so on but uh, certainly now there are uh, probably such decisions about sanctions uh, are quite negatively um, accepted by uh, Russia because sometimes it's not very clear what is the aim of such a sanctions because sometimes and I think that sometimes very tough policies uh, and uh, tough sanctions just can uh, worsen the situation instead of uh, um, improving uh, the situation and it uh, renders quite difficult to negotiate and to dialogue and so on. But uh, nevertheless, I think that, uh, for example, if you hear our uh, mass media, uh, very, very frequent is uh, the problem of different values of Russia and different values uh, of uh, the West. And uh, I think that uh, it's very important to discuss such problems. For example, uh, when we uh, speak about cooperation with other states and so on, usually the first place is about our commercial relations, about energetic relations and so on. But we must discuss such problems uh, uh, as our values uh, different or non-different in our values and so on. And uh, in uh, such a case, I think that your initiative of the Russian house in Brussels is very, very important because it's uh, the dialogue between us now. Uh, just we can discuss very many different problems and about diplomacy, about foreign policy about our values and so on. And uh, such uh, platforms must be more frequent and more numerous just to discuss problem, problems, not to limit uh, our relations only with uh, some economic and uh, trade exchange and so on, but discuss problems. And now with uh, high technologies, with this Zoom, it's quite uh, uh, convenient uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, all problems we have and just to overcome such prejudices and such uh, uh, misunderstandings uh, between us and so on. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And uh, we have just a couple of minutes left, and I would like also to address another question from the participants. How to become a diplomat in Russia? <laughs> How to become a diplomat? Uh, it's very simple. <laughs> just you must study well. You must study well. While in the Soviet times, uh, it was a uh, just uh, necessary to study uh, Tower Mgimo uh, University because it was the only center for preparing future diplomats. And uh, uh, that's why it was quite difficult just uh, because uh, the, it was the limited number of 
students, so you had to overcome uh, very difficult exams. For example, I remember I um, had five or six exams and written and oral and so on, just to be accepted to the university. Uh, so it was, and uh, all of us, uh, when we graduate, uh, graduated from the university, all of our students uh, went directly to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, not women, <laughs> but unfortunately, because it's, well, it was quite a masculist uh, organization. And uh, there was no women, no ambassador women and so on. But uh, now the situation is different because now, uh, for example, if you want to be a diplomat, uh, you can study not only at our university, but in every university of Russia, you can study law or international relations or languages or, or even other uh, matters. And then you must uh, just uh, to apply to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and there is a, a competition. And so there are kind of exams. And if uh, everything will go well, so you will become diplomat. And uh, there are a lot of girls now who uh, go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I hope that uh, finally our diplomacy will include many, many very talented women. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And just a small quick question by our partners, uh, Comité Diplomatique from uh, Ulbe University, please. Yes, please. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time today. Uh, just a quick question about what you just said. I, uh, we have a lot of ministries of foreign affairs here in Europe uh, who are trying to gather to get more women in dip diplomatic career. And just a little curiosity, can you tell me maybe what's the percentage of women in uh, diplomacy in Russia, if you have the numbers, so we can compare maybe with Belgium? Um, but uh, now I I have no uh, numbers uh, at my disposal. But I just advise you to go to Facebook on my page on the Facebook, and there are in English also uh, articles and uh, the article about. Uh, gender problem in Russian diplomacy and policy. You can read it, but I uh, can only say that, unfortunately, even today, because of such, uh, probably of such Soviet period when there was no women, and it's very strange because the first women ambassador was Soviet ambassador, Alexandra Kolontai, but then there was no more. Uh, women uh, of the diplomatic career, women ambassadors. And now, unfortunately, we have only two women ambassadors in our diplomacy. Only two women, it's terrible. And I wrote a lot about it, but I hope uh, only that now many, many girls go to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, there are a lot of girls now, and uh, they try to overcome such uh, patriarchal uh, attitude of uh, personal department and so on. And I hope that uh, the situation will change uh, quite quickly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zonova. Uh, it was a great pleasure uh, to see you today with us, uh, even online, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, we will be able to bring the delegation to Russia and maybe also visit uh, Mgimo University. Uh, so, uh, and maybe meet you. It would be a great pleasure for us. Great honor. Uh, so thank you everybody uh, for this uh, session. If you have any questions, you can also address us. We will uh, send them to professor and uh, uh, try to, to answer them. Uh, now we have a quick break. 
and uh, we will uh, start with our next uh, session about uh, uh, russian belgian cooperation uh, so uh, please uh, take your time to make maybe some gymnastic and movement in order not to sit <laughs> thank you very much it was very interesting to dialogue with you thank you thank you so much thank you also Добрый день. А, у нас пока перерыв небольшой. Добрый день. Да, и а, мы скоро начнем. Понятно, спасибо.
dear participants, we'll wait a couple of minutes and uh, we will start soon. Look, Jan, um, may I actually ask you a question? Yes. Yeah, is it possible to put on the screen presentation? Yes, sure. Sure, of course. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Great. So, uh, dear friends, uh, our short break is coming to an end and we are continuing. Please, if you are ready, uh, write me in the chat or put plus, put, switch on the camera. Okay. So uh, we can start our uh, second uh, session and uh, I'm very glad to introduce you to our experts. Uh, right now, we are going to speak about uh, Russian-Belgian cooperation. And Russian-Belgian cooperation is famous for its economic relations. So uh, our guests uh, are uh, Artyom Golikov from the Belgian Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce in Russia. Uh, Maria Pushkova, who is a director of uh, Benelux uh, Center. Uh, it's a research center at the Russian University, um, Russian Humanitarian uh, University. And uh, the coordinator of uh, Benelux uh, Center, Anna Balashova. So uh, please, uh, uh, you can uh, always uh, ask uh, the questions, uh, the, the, the system is the same as uh, at the previous uh, meeting. And right now I would like uh, to give uh, the floor uh, first uh, to uh, Artyom Golikov uh, to make an introduction of the chamber, please. All right, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to represent the Chamber of Commerce 
and I will first tell you about the functions of our chamber, and then I will also elaborate on the uh, current state of economic affairs and economic ties between Belgium and Russia. So let us proceed um, to the next slide. Here's the session plan. I hope to take 10 minutes of your time and your questions are welcomed after the presentation. And just as I've mentioned, I will tell you the core functions, the representatives and members of the chamber for you to see the scope and the scale of cooperation that exists between Russia, Belgium and other uh, Luxembourg and Netherlands firms. Uh, and also I will elaborate a little bit on how uh, the trade chamber uh, has been operating in the wake and in the process of pandemic throughout the pandemic. Um, yeah, just a few words about myself. I'm, I myself is, I'm a student of higher school of economics that this is one of the uh, Russian universities, national research universities. I also happen to be a student in the University of London and I study international relations. Um, I've previously worked at um, International Bank, HSBC, I think you're quite aware of it. And I also had the chance to work for the Ministry for Economic Development in Russia at Trade Negotiations Department. And uh, for the past half of the year, I've been working in uh, Belgian Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. Um, mostly my work uh, as of a member, as of a representative, um, occupies um, you know, preparing the newsletter issues, assisting the organization of business missions. And the Trade Chamber is actually very famous for the business missions that are organized to various Russian regions, such as Tula, Kurgan, or Penza. Um, apart from that, the, the Chamber of Commerce organizes a lot of uh, CEO business breakfasts. These are sort of the events where uh, the CEO of the companies or top re representatives are uh, capable of meeting Russian authorities, the deputy ministers. Um, there was recently in October a meeting uh, with the representative from the Ministry for uh, Trade and Industry. And also um, we participate in various online conferences to provide insights on Russian economic state of affairs. Um, I also managed to publish an article in the uh, Diplomatic World magazine and uh, if you have by chance encountered it before or you don't know what it is, here's the QR code, um, you can check it out. And also, um, I guess maybe we'll be able to share the presentation after the, after the report that uh, you have a glance at it again. So here, here are just some of the photos of what we do, uh, some of the meetings that we carry out on weekly, monthly basis and some of the photos from the business mission. This is a very uh, peculiar business mission that we had to Tula region. Uh, we visited the auto, automotive uh, factory facility uh, in the special economic zone. And this is what we do on a regular basis in various regions for Belgian businesses to see uh, the opportunities for development in Russia, in various Russian regions. And uh, this is, this is uh, a reciprocal bilateral uh, kind of procedure. There are also a lot of efforts done in the in the Belgian Chamber of Russia. A lot of actions are happening at this level. Um, here are some of the uh, key representatives and members of the chamber. Um, some of the core Russian companies such as Siverstal and Rusvenil, which are uh, participating a lot in specific production, um, and also a lot of a lot of uh, juridical law firms, uh, Romanov and partners, and a lot of Belgian businesses that are exporting a lot uh, throughout the world, all over the world. Uh, Belgium is famous for its chocolate. So actually um, some of the Belgian chocolate is also can be found in Russia and um, the, the Chamber of Commerce assisted um, in it to, to, for, for these companies to enter Russian market and also many, many other uh, companies, including Banking Sphere, you can see Swift, uh, Gazprom Bank, and other companies. Um, here are some of the uh, some of the vice presidents, CEOs, and presidents of the Trade Chamber of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, they are all people who are to some extent related to business, and 
all of them know um, how to foster the economic relations between the two countries. That's what they have been doing for the past 10, 10 years. Um, and actually, just for you to understand um, how does the relationship between the, the, the two countries through the Chamber of Commerce function, here are some of the competences that are provided by the Chamber. Um, it, it includes any kind of um, legal assistance and assistance on obtaining visas, sometimes also legal advice and uh, accreditation of foreign representative offices. So um, throughout the pandemic, um, the, the Chamber of Commerce had to adapt a lot to the conditions in which it had to operate. For this reason, uh, the, uh, the online web lounges were introduced and they were conducted on a, on a regular basis, people to connect and to understand the uh, development opportunities, the crisis resolution opportunities, for instance, Chris Weaver, uh, the person who's the CEO for Macro Advisory LTD, was invited uh, not much time ago uh, to, to, to speak and to present on the state of uh, Russian economy. Also, um, if you, if you want to have some more insights on what uh, Russian uh, economic state currently is, you can, um, you can also scan the QR code and go to the YouTube and watch the video there. Uh, where Chris presented all of his information that he has. Moving on, um, let me tell you about other competences during the pandemic. Um, actually, some of the some of the events are still conducted not only on the online basis but also in offline in the analog world because Russia is smoothly recovering from the pandemic. Um, and for instance, in April 2021, uh, a trans Russia. Uh, will be held. This is the special event for logistical companies and supply chain companies to exchange their technologies and cooperate together. And a lot of Belgian companies are planning to attend. For instance, uh, I'll be representing Comco, the company uh, that is uh, exporting special technologies um, solutions for, for the logistics industry. And um, Speaking, speaking of the Russian-Belgian economic ties, despite the weakening of the conjuncture um, in the last uh, several years, Belgian and Luxembourg business retain faith in the Russian market. And there are quite a lot of proofs to that. Um, the proof of this is the opening of new offices. For instance, uh, in January, Ehlers, it is one of the major Belgian logistic firms opened its office, a major office in St. Petersburg. Also the acquisitions and uh, construction of new production lines continue. Uh, once again, on all of the business missions that are conducted, um, a lot of special agreements are concluded, not only between the Chamber of Commerce and the administration of the region, um, but also on the B2B basis, business to business basis, as you wish. And um, you see, the virus should be thought uh, by the preservation of economic ties and communications. This is the belief held by the Chamber of Commerce and by its CEO, Alek uh, Bazorov. Uh, and also in November 2020, BLCC Russia with other chambers asked Russian government to resume international flights. And it has been successful. A lot of international flights started to be resumed just for the business people on both sides in Russia, in Europe, uh, to return safely either to their place of work or to uh, their place of living, so to their home. And uh, I guess this is just one of the instances, uh, the reality is that uh, the Chamber of Commerce is a lobbying organization uh, who has the authority of its members and the trust entailed to it uh, to uh, to promote certain decisions on uh, in relation to the government. Um, so yeah, here are some of the pictures of the uh, of the opening ceremony of the office from January. Um, let me further speak on the current state of Russian economy. So um, generally, uh, in 2020, um, there has been some difficulties faced uh, by the Russian economy, just like everywhere. 
and along with the hospitality sector, industries with a high share of important components uh, probably suffered the most. The collapse of the European borders, uh, weeks of delays due to the restrictions imposed by the first wave of the pandemic, as well as the fall of the rubble caused an increase uh, in the import prices. Now, uh, this may seem negative, but still many foreign companies are now considering the localization of the production for the components, uh, for their components in close proximity to the market. And this is how actually uh, Russian businesses and Belgian businesses can uh, benefit by merging their efforts and continuing the construction of uh, facilities. The global income deficit of international corporations in Russia was compensated by the income of their Russian divisions. Now, this is a very uh, serious conclusion because uh, with, uh, with a rather uh, declining prices for exports and imports, uh, some of the companies managed to gain profits in the wake of the pandemic. So for some companies, um, and for some Belgian companies specifically, it is still very beneficial to maintain Russian departments, and they do, and they do so. Um, also, the production lines of um, the members of the Chamber of Commerce did not stop a single day in 2020. Each plant independently applied and pre prescribed sanitary measures and everything went as smoothly as it could be, which represents the um, high degree of cooperation and contact which exists between all departments to uh, clarify all the necessary questions and um, solve the problems in a quick, in a quick form. Some of the areas of the economy benefited a lot by the COVID-19 pandemic, such as those in the field of medicine, the pharmaceutical cluster, companies offering services in the field of telecommunications, IT services especially. Um, there are quite a lot of such companies in Belgium, as uh, Belgium has a lot of uh, industry facilities and a lot of high-tech companies. So for them, it is still beneficial to remain in Russia, and Russia places its faith in the services and products of Belgian companies. Uh, the Chamber is signing a lot of memoranda for cooperation with several Russian uh, regions to allow the support of its members. Also, the recent prioritization of the well being of improvement uh, and the, as well as the protection trend for our planet, made uh, BLCC Russia establish the Expert Council on Sustainable Development and Green Finance. Both Russia and Benelux countries are capable of offering world-class technologies in the field of environmental protection. And now efforts are also uh, joined together to make this happen. Russia is on the forefront of developing the hydrogen technology um, and related projects, while Belgian businesses master the expert of other green technology. And in different regions, uh, Russia, uh, Russian, Belgian and Luxembourgish companies open new factories, uh, distribution, logistics, and research centers on a regular basis. Uh, another, another initiative that might, uh, might seem important to you and interesting is the common economic space from uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok, uh, which the, the Chamber of Commerce joined recently uh, to develop a project of green corridor between Russia and Europe. So I guess uh, it, it can be inferred that the green sector and the sector of high tech, uh, environmentally friendly technology and sustainable development is on the rise. And these sectors are gaining a lot of impetus and attention um, on, on both sides in Belgium and in Russia, which is of course a very positive trend. And once again, the motto of our Belgian Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce in Russia is to act and succeed together. This, uh, this motto has been in every action that the Chamber concluded, and we believe that there is indeed a lot of uh, potential spheres for cooperation between the countries, between Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Russia. Once again, uh, let me thank you for your attention. Now your questions are welcomed, uh, so please be sure to ask them if you want to clarify anything. I'll be very glad to answer. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for the presentation. It's really uh, very interesting. And uh, uh, I, uh, while our participants are preparing questions, uh, I would like actually to address one uh, uh, 
do you uh, maybe deal somehow or uh, in, with the Chinese affairs? And if you could comment, uh, what is the difference uh, between uh, Russia and Belgium uh, towards uh, international cooperation with China, who is a very big uh, um, partner, I would say? Okay, yeah. Uh, um, okay, thank you for your question. Um, it's very interesting. I would say that, first of all, the Chamber of Commerce um, operates not only in Russia, it also operates in many Eurasian countries, because Moscow is the capital for this region, and so the many interests, uh, economic interests and contacts, they overlap there. This is how we uh, have some of the, some, some of the communication uh, also with the, uh, with the regions of East. Uh, Middle East and um, some of the post-Soviet countries, where uh, the the interests of China are also growing and being present. Um, speaking of the of the type of communication, you see, I guess it is just as important to highlight the fact that um, the, the 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 initiative of this chambers of commerce. Uh, in uh, in the countries of Belgium and Luxembourg, they have existed for 100 years. Uh, this year is actually the anniversary since uh, the, the first chambers of commerce uh, were created for both countries, for for Luxembourg and for Belgium, as as an entity, as a unity. And uh, there is a certain faith that is placed um, in Belgium and in Luxembourg as partners, as strategic partners, because they can provide. A lot of um, a lot of specific uh, technical solutions, high tech solutions, and this is why um, Russia maintains its interests in cooperation with these countries. Speaking and comparing it with China, I believe uh, that um, China is also now capable of presenting such solutions. Uh, but you see, it is just impossible to neglect Europe as a market both for Russian companies, and it's just as impossible to neglect Russia as a potential market for European companies. This is why uh, the, 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 the potential for cooperation will never cease. It's just, uh, it's, I guess it's sort of irrelevant to compare it with China in this sense, because you know, there are a lot of historical con contacts that exist between the countries. Um, and yeah, I guess that's that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, questions from the participants. Uh, so, uh, uh, Julien, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess uh, Julian may struggle to put the microphone on. I will, I will still read the question for everybody and answer it. I'll address it. Right, so the question which Julian raised is uh, about, uh, so what is it? Do geopolitical considerations impact our daily work? Well, Julian, thank you very much indeed for your question. It's a great question. Um, you see the Chamber of Commerce as, as a not-for-profit organization, it operates uh, abstaining from politics and abstaining from religion. Really, uh, our goals, they simply are reserved to the area of economic ties and economic contacts. This is why uh, geopolitical considerations, they are not really affecting our work. And um, this can be proven once again uh, by, um, I believe by, by, by the historical evidence you see uh, since 2014, um, of course, there, there was, a slight decrease of cooperation between the uh, between Belgium and Russia, uh, also Luxembourg and Russia, but it, it has steadily recovered since then. And now even in the in throughout the pandemic, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of contacts, a lot of uh, new facilities being opened, which I believe proves the fact that, that the geopolitical considerations in this sense, they are of a second place of the first is the economic benefits for both countries, for companies on both sides. And of course, uh, it is also the provision of the right technology in the right place. I've spoken, uh, you see, there is, there is a rise and th th there is an increasing need for green technology. 
in, in many countries. And in this sense, uh, all countries are cooperating very well without any considerations and concerns. All right. Um, Lucian, are you here? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, then there was a question from uh, Augustine. Right. Yes, thank you. First, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you. And um, yeah, my question was about that uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok initiative. Well, that seems quite interesting. I've had uh, five minutes to time to uh, check the website. Um, is there, have you seen over the last few years, uh, an interest uh, over the, um, the European part and the Russian part on develop, developing um, infra infrastructure projects? So uh, to connect Russia uh, to Europe in terms of roads, in terms of modernization of, of uh, train lines, because this could have uh, great uh, uh, political uh, consequences for um, understanding uh, and uh, diplomacy, obviously. So I, I would, my question was about this uh, infra infrastructure, infrastructure projects between Russia yeah. and Europe. Okay, um, yeah. Augustine, it's a very, very nice question. I believe that um, the, uh, the potential kind of problems that might be encountered in terms of constructing the infrastructure, developing the roads and uh, any kind of connections that have not existed prior to to the current state 2021 is actually the, the the fact that russia is separated by the european union uh through several countries there are many countries that are kind of um sort of separating russia from 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 the eu and in this sense it requires a lot of effort and cooperation to uh to negotiate such infrastructure projects but um you see once again um, Europe has had historical ties with Russia for centuries. Uh, the roads have existed and have been constructed many years before, um, before now. And, and, and so there is really not a lot of need to construct the highways that might help. There is just the need to establish the correct regime where the goods and services between the countries may flow, may flow smoother, you see? Uh, when, when there is some legal uh, relaxations, when there are some, some of the legal uh, restrictions that are lifted in terms of trade between the countries, between Belgium and Russia, for instance, or between the EU countries from Lisbon to uh, Russia and Vladivostok, when they are lifted, this, this might actually help. And in this sense, uh, there are a lot of forums that are conducted on both sides um, to, to assist that, but still the, there has not been uh, any major acts that have, have been signed so far. But I believe there is a lot of room for development in this sense and, well, sometime it will happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. And uh, then there was a question from Ronald. Okay. Uh, hello. Yeah, hello. Hello. Excuse me. So I was, I was thinking now, and I'm Ronald Terrazas. I am doing my postdoc in uh, biotechnology. I am living in Poland. I am from Bolivia. So I would like to know, like, this has been this idea about redundant supply chains that will be established in the future due to this pandemic has been a common trend. So not to, the, to not to depend so much in China. So I was thinking that um, would it, could Russia take advantage of that, or they would, or the sanctions? Um, regulations could prevent that because for me that, that there are only three alternatives for Europe. It's the Middle East, it's Russia or Africa. I don't know what would be your, your take on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I've actually, speaking of my take, I've noted that now many companies are considering the localization of their production forces and also the localization sort of the sourcing of their, uh, all of their products for their supply chains on a local level. Uh, this is one of the ways to avoid the problem that you have mentioned uh, of declining the dependency from China. And it is indeed urgent uh, in the sense of after the pandemic, I believe it is indeed urgent. Um, I believe that uh, we, we th there is indeed a lot of possibilities for that, uh, for Russia to become the sort of localization market for the supply chains. Um, but it is gonna take a lot of time 
for us to see actually whether it's going to happen or not. Now, as I've just mentioned in the presentation in the report, now a lot of European companies are actually looking for the for the for for just for the space for, for the sweet spot for their uh, production facilities to be built in many many Russian regions. Not only, for example, in Moscow region in the Moscow Oblast, uh, which is which is sort of the logistical center for Russia, but also outside in St. Petersburg, which is another logistical center for Russia, and in the outside of these two regions. So yeah, there is a lot of potential for what you've said, for Russia to become such, uh, such a place and for it to take an advantage. But um, I believe that it, only the talk will show actually how, how, how this uh, diversification happens. All right, thank you for your question yeah. again, Walt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the answer. And uh, please, Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, again. My name is Bruno Rokaria. I am from Zagreb, Croatia. I'm a Master of Political Science, and I now work as independent consultant and advisor. Uh, I have two questions, actually. First one is, what are the main future economic fields of cooperation between Europe, let's say, Belarus and Russia. So let's say in long term strategic goals, 10, 20 years. And second one is what is the level of lobbying in European institutions, European Union institutions and Belarus national institutions uh, from Russian companies? So which types of companies lobby the most from Russia there? Thank you very much. Bruno, yeah, thank you for your question. I will address the first part of it and then uh, come to the second part. So um, speaking, speaking of, the, uh, of the future economic fields of cooperation, there are definitely green finance and a sustainable development. These are kind of the core areas for development. And in this sense, um, Luxembourg, for example, and Belgium as well can help a lot uh, to the Russian companies in terms of funding. There is a lot of, uh, a lot of financial assistance for the Russian businesses to open new facilities both in Russia and outside of it. Uh, and of course, the technology, the technology that is provided by the Belgian in industrial firms and the Luxembourgish firms, uh, it is incredibly beneficial and valuable for the Russian firms. Um, once again, as I've mentioned in the presentation, uh, Russia is continuing to, uh, to export a lot its um, energy sources. Uh, this is most importantly gas. And we, I guess we have to highlight once again and say that uh, gas is indeed um, more or less um, environmentally friendly compared to coal or any other, also oil that is being burned. Um, and Russia is actively developing the hydrogen uh, power carriers that would, that would be very effective in the future. But of course, it takes a lot of time to develop the, the sufficient technology. So yeah, these are, this are the main uh, sort of um, sort of spheres for cooperation, finance, uh, environmentally friendly finance, green finance, and uh, the technology, the spread of technology. Russia also with, uh, with the European businesses, uh, especially in the energies level of lobbying. Uh, you see the level of lobbying is not as, uh, as great as it can be. There are chambers of commerce that propagate Russian interests in the countries uh, of the European Union. That th this is the only sphere to do so. And uh, for the past couple of years, uh, this is the the sphere in which uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, of Belgium and Luxembourg in Russia has also been participating active actively. Um, Russian businesses have been trying to emphasize on the liberalization of the visa regime, visa regime that exists between the countries of Europe and Russia. Um, is not as fruitful for the economic activity as it can be. There are a lot of difficulties for the CEOs or technicians to enter um, to enter both countries uh, if, if the need for, to do so exists. And it has particularly exacerbated uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. So um, there has been a lot of opportunities for the technicians to enter uh, Russia uh, and also for Russian 
technical specialists to, to enter Europe if there is the need to do so. And there has been a lot of communication between the departments of Russian authorities and European authorities to, to issue visas, basically. But still, there has very little effort been made for the CEOs and top representatives of businesses on both sides made uh, to issue visas. For example, uh, there is there is this sort of statement that uh, top authorities, um, vice presidents, since they are not technical specialists, there is no need for them to enter the countries even throughout the pandemic if the need to do so exists. In fact, this is still very important and urgent as many offices are being open and the CEOs and the vice presidents, they need to visit those facilities. Uh, so yeah, actually Russian businesses has been propagating a lot the relaxation of the, of the visa regime. Thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Artom. Uh, and uh, now, uh, actually, just uh, uh, because we are a bit limited in time, with uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, our big friend Maria Pushkova, who will also um, uh, tell uh, about uh, the Benelux uh, Center that works for the uh, Russian State University for Humanities. And then uh, if we have time, we will come back also to the chamber, if you don't mind. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm very glad to be here to participate in this event. Yeah, uh, I work at the Russian State University for the Humanities and uh, uh, it's uh, um, something different from uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, really. Uh, first of all, uh, I will introduce myself. I'm director of Benelux Center and I'm uh, the teacher of the Dutch language. Mm. And uh, some words about our center. Uh, Benelux Research Center by Russian State University was opened on initiative of our university and support of the Russian Chamber of Commerce and a number of uh, the Dutch and Belgium universities. Today, when relations uh, between Russia and the, and the European countries are experiencing not the best times, the center sees its main task in continuing humanitarian dialogue through cultural and educational diplomacy. Uh, this allows us to maintain and develop relations uh, with our Benelux partners and find new cooperation opportunities. The partners of our center are the East European Association of Dutch Language Teachers, the International Association of Dutch Language Teachers, and the Union of Dutch Language. Uh, Benelux Research Center supports all bilateral programs of our university among which Erasmus programs, all kinds of Erasmus programs. And while the Benelux Center exists by the Russian State University, it doesn't limit its activities only uh, to including the subjects related to the uh, um, uh, studies of Dutch language, countries, history, culture, co economy, political system and social processes but it becomes the real uh, Benelux Center where everybody is welcome, including students from other universities, uh, where everybody can participate in all events organized by the center. We are the main place where conferences of our East European platform are held. Uh, where, what makes the Benelux Research Center so special? Benelux Center is the only center in Moscow and Russia which provides next to educational programs for students, a big scale of events for people who are interested in uh, Dutch language and uh, history of Benelux countries and Benelux studies. The most of our activities are free of charge. We have achieved this by establishing a reliable relations with business community in Moscow, with um, Belgian Luxembourg Chamber and colleagues from the Dutch universities and Belgian universities. Together, we organize thematic lectures, cultural events, uh, among which uh, Sinterklaas Dach, uh, Koningsdag, and, uh, and um, uh, some others. Our volunteers uh, work at such cultural manifestations. Uh, we organize conversation clubs for Russian students who study Dutch language and uh, European studies. We organize a conversation club for 
uh, Dutch and Belgian students uh, who are interested in Russia and Russian language. We organize roundtable conferences uh, with participation of our colleagues from Belgium, from the Netherlands, from uh, different uh, regions of Russia. Um, we have a very interesting joint uh, project uh, with um, the University of Groningen, um, summer school and winter school. Um, uh, these, uh, uh, our projects are very popular among the students from different Moscow universities due to its programs, which includes study, business and culture aspects. The center's Dutch language courses are popular among the people interested in Dutch studies and uh, who are working for Dutch uh, enterprises and Belgian enterprises. The Benelux Center is of the opinion that dialogue is the only instrument to talk with each other to discuss problems and find solutions. Much more important is what unites us and not what divides us. And um, uh, thanks for your attention, uh, but I am not uh, alone here. I am with my assistant. And now I give the floor to my assistant, so dear student, Anna, uh, who will tell you about our new projects and activities of our center. And if there are any questions, uh, we are um, ready to answer uh, your questions uh, later. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marie. Yeah. So thank you very much, Marie Nikolaevna. So uh, my name is Anna Volashova. I am uh, the uh, I'm a student of the third year in Moscow State Linguistic University, uh, and uh, I also work in Benelux Center. Yes, and as, as uh, an assistant of Marie Nikolaevna, and uh, I am uh, a coordinator of the projects which are connected with the youth. So mainly with the youth of uh, the Benelux region and the Benelux region countries. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the activities which are being conducted within our center and uh, so how we live and uh, what we are like mainly doing. So uh, as Maria Nikolaevna has already mentioned, our center was opened uh, on the basis of uh, the Russian State University for the Humanities in 2009. Yeah, and nine. And so until recently, chain, uh, teaching of uh, the Dutch language was in fact the main activity of the center. But a few years ago, the center also became uh, began to become a platform for a variety of events covering a wide range of topics related to the Benelux region. Thus, on the basis of uh, actually our center, conversational clubs, so-called speaking clubs or prat clubs, as you may call it, I'm uh, I'm a host of uh, so such speaking clubs, and I will elaborate a little bit on this uh, topic just a little bit later. Yes, so uh, we also conduct uh, so those speaking clubs which are in Dutch and in Russian, as uh, Maria has already mentioned. Then public lectures, international conferences, meetings for foreign guests. Uh, so, and they all are being held on the monthly basis. Uh, the topics of the meetings, uh, which we conduct, are mostly devoted to some social and economic and political and linguistical, uh, linguistic, sorry, um, like uh, things which are connected to the Benelux countries. Then, uh, of course, the peculiarities of the countries of the Dutch language, because we are the center who, um, who actually teaches the Dutch language, and we also are the students who study this Dutch language within the center. Uh, however, uh, one really interesting thing about us, I would say, is that uh, we have recently expanded the scope of uh, the events conducted within the center. So since October of the last year, we got acquainted with uh, a new direction of work uh, within which we currently implement the majority of our project. So this is an absolute discovery for a theme for us, which is uh, a historical memory. So we have uh, several projects within this uh, direction, so historical memory. Uh, first of all, those are some conferences uh, which are aimed to get the audience, uh, the audience and uh, the participants acquainted with the problem of historical memory. So and Russian history, history of the Second World War and how close it is actually so the history of this uh, like it is to the history of the European countries so our Russian history of the Second World War 
and the history of the Second World War of the European countries. So I'm talking about uh, mainly at the moment about the resistance in Belgium, which was in the, during the Second World War, uh, and uh, the participants of that like uh, resistant uh, resistant movement were the Russian soldiers and the Russian partisans, and not many people know about that, unfortunately. But we're trying to uh, like get uh, as many people as possible acquainted with this topic. So it's interesting, I guess. Uh, then um, a little later, the Benelux Center decided to go uh, beyond the study of the history of the resistance movement in Belgium. And so currently we are about to launch a, a new project uh, with uh, the fund Soviet Erfeld. Uh, maybe you know about that. Uh, so this, uh, this is a special fund which um, which um, is uh, in Amersfoort in the Netherlands. And this foundation is working uh, on preserving the, uh, the memory of the Soviet soldiers who died on the territory of the Netherlands during the Second World War. It is working on uh, restoration of their names, uh, searching like for their descendants. Yeah, it's also a really interesting fund uh, because in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands exists uh, a whole uh, yeah, founding which is uh, working with this topic so yeah it's interesting it, it's really unique i would say um uh, with the uh with the outset of the pandemic the life of our center drastically has drastically changed i would say as well i guess uh, as uh, the life of the majority of the countries at the moment uh so uh, we moved to, totally to online format but we're trying to you know just start working in offline but still it's uh, yeah it's difficult but we're trying but um I would say that contrary to all the expectations, uh, this format has opened uh, has opened us incredible horizons. So for our center, uh, to begin with, we uh, are able at the moment to, for example, uh, invite foreign guests to our lectures, to our conference, which uh, are at the moment abroad in some other country. We are able to invite also some hosts to our speaking clubs, uh, also who are like people who are staying abroad. Uh, then uh, really it, it, it became really helpful for us, for example, to invite the students, uh, to invite students, yes, and the youth uh, from the Benelux countries, which are also abroad at the moment. And so we still can make uh, speaking clubs with them because they can join us. And so this is, yeah, this is really nice. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think my favorite topic, which I adore talking about, is uh, the like speaking are uh, the speaking clubs because this is yeah this is the thing uh, which I give uh, like the majority of my uh, energy to. Uh, so in general, uh, such speaking clubs are an integral part of our event plan of the uh, of the year. Yeah, they are conducted every month. Uh, and uh, so, I don't know, maybe you already know what this format is, but uh, it's like a meeting format where participants learning a particular language have the opportunity to immerse themselves in the language environment for a while. So communicate with the native speaker of the language being studied and discuss various uh, interesting topics. Because uh, talking about Russia in an environment where a lack of uh, conversational practice is a crucial problem, our center finds such events an incredibly important and integral part of the training. Because, like uh, for example, living in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, it is easy to communicate with people in English, and so you may work in your English better. But in Russia, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it's problematic, I would say. And so, for example, the last speaking club we had, it was about Kamchatka and Vladivostok, uh, but not only about some like uh, super popular sites, which you may Google everywhere and just get to know it easily, but it was about some insights. So uh, about some hidden places, even like I was the host, yes, and I was the host with a, a friend of mine. Uh, and so even we didn't know about those things. And so, yeah, it was interesting for the participants uh, to listen about that. And we got really, um, yeah, we got, we got great feedback from people who joined us. Yeah, it was really nice. And for example, the next Dutch speaking club, which we are going to be having, uh, is uh, uh, is going to be about the about Belgium in the First World War, uh, and even uh, we even though we didn't ha haven't had like this uh, speaking club yet we have already got so much feedback that people are so interested in this topic they really want to hear about Belgium in the First World War, and that is why yes we we feel that. 
people like the events which we conduct actually and so in conclusion uh i would like to point out that over the past two years the Benelux center has passed um a long and incredible path we have grown up uh, we managed to attract a huge number of people in our project so attract a large number of students and young people and at the moment like the topics that are discussed at the events of our center are much broader than just historical memory so conversational clubs have become more than just oral practice for people who like this practice uh, and we see the goal of the development of our center in building an intercultural dialogue between the youth of uh, the Russian Federation and the youth of the countries of the Benelux region. And we, may, we have actually much more common than most people can imagine. And so that is why I find uh, our this dialogue really important for both sides. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Dear guests, thank you very much for your attention. We are looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Maria Pushkova and uh, Anna Balashova for your presentation. And uh, just a question, uh, is there really a big interest from uh, students uh, to study the languages? And uh, also if uh, the students from other uh, universities can participate in your projects? Yes, it's a <laughs> you, you cannot imagine this, but there is real, really big interest from the students of Russia to study uh, Dutch language and European European studies. Uh, for example, uh, we have also as as guests as students from. Uh, um, Gimo University, from MGU University, from MGLU University, the, uh, so from all universities in Moscow, five uh, universities um, who um, don't have such place to gather together to discuss things, uh, to participate in events. Uh, so it's because we are so unique, uh, uh, we make such platform and we are available also in Facebook, in contact, in Instagram, in uh, all um, possible uh, social uh, networks. Uh, so all students uh, can participate in our events and it's absolutely free of charge. Only summer school and winter school uh, cannot be free of charge uh, for some reasons. Uh, but uh, we are uh, open to all uh, who are interested in European studies and uh, Benelux countries. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, also just uh, following this uh, topic, uh, there was a question from uh, Bruno. And uh, before uh, he will address the question, I would like to tell that there is a museum that you are working on the museum uh, together with uh, Belgium about the resistance. Uh, yes, uh, we are working about uh, this uh, project. It uh, was not a museum offline, it is a museum online, a virtual museum of resistance, uh, because uh, there are very many materials uh, who are um, gathered in Belgium and in Russia from uh, Russian uh, archives. Uh, so we will um, gather all these evidences, all these materials, for the future generations. Um, so um, maybe Anna will uh, talk about it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Maria has yeah, truly uh, mentioned the idea that uh, there is so much information overall, so everywhere. And uh, so the idea is to uh, set up some platform, which will just be the platform for all of this information, which will be sorted. And uh, for example, we have such project, which is called uh, Card of Memory. Uh, and there is uh, there are many people who died, so, so Soviet Oh, Soviet, sorry. Yeah, uh, Soviet soldiers who died uh, on the territory of Benelux countries, but their relatives don't know about that. And so uh, they, there are just graves, unnamed graves, and that is why. So, and they are being found. So by that, for example, fund, which I was talking about, so Soviet era felt. Uh, and so there, uh, we um, actually made such a card, such a map, uh, which shows uh, that 
this person, particular person, he died in the Netherlands and where you can find his grave, for example. And it is really important, for example, for his, uh, for people who are trying to um, find their relatives who perished in the Second World War, and they may find them actually on that map, so on that list of uh, the perished members, and they may even visit his grave uh, where he was, yeah, in, yeah, or his grave, for example, in the Netherlands or in Belgium, so it's really important. But if we're talking about the museum, yes, it's also interesting uh, because uh, we uh, also uh, write several, all of the time we write some um, articles about the um, partisans, so Soviet partisans uh, who uh, were the members of uh, the resistance movement. Uh, and uh, so they have uh, really um, fascinating stories. So the stories of their lives, how they survived uh, or how they, they didn't survive about, uh, so how, what true heroes they were. And that is why this site, so in this virtual museum is also a platform for such stories, which must be heard. So, because it's really important to know the history of our, yeah, of our parents, of our grandparents. Yeah, thank you so much for your answer. But uh, I, actually, I know the question, but just maybe to clarify a bit more. Uh, but why are there uh, Soviet soldiers in Belgium? Um, <laughs> yes, uh, you know, uh, the beginning of the uh, Second World War, uh, was um, very unfortunate for the um, Soviet Union, for Russia. Very many soldiers uh, were captured by um, uh, German, uh, Germany and were sent uh, for work in Ardenne, uh, in Belgium. Uh, for, um, but uh, they didn't want uh, to work there for um, column nine equate, uh, I don't know in English this coal word. Minus. Coal minus, yes. And uh, so um, they um, uh, found uh, the way uh, to um, organize uh, such uh, groups of uh, resistance. And uh, they fought together with uh, Belgian soldiers, uh, Belgian um, uh, resistance soldiers. Uh, so um, these soldiers, uh, their um, fortune was very tragic because uh, they were, um, after the uh, Second World War, they were sent to uh, camps uh, in Russia. And it, it is the reason why their relatives uh, don't know about uh, what ha have happened with these soldiers. And uh, um, it, uh, we have such um, a th uh, such theme, we remember them. And it's about these uh, forgotten soldiers of the Second World War. Um, maybe I have answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, then there was a question from Bruno, if you would like to address it. Yes, thank you very much. Well, my first question was uh, this difference between communist and not communist resistance. Were, was there in Netherlands only communist resistance or the Soviet one, or were there some other resistance? And the second question is following that, how is this period of history actually presented in Netherlands? And are there any monuments for Soviet soldiers in Netherlands or Belarus? Thank you. Um, what um, I can say is that in the Netherlands, um, our soldiers, Soviet soldiers, uh, didn't participate in uh, resistance uh, because uh, they were held in camps, in uh, um, German camps, and were killed there. Uh, but in Belgium, the situation was absolutely different because they, work for, um, they were working for uh, coal mining and it was possible uh, to, run, uh, to run from this um, column mine. And they were supported uh, uh, for the local people. And local people brought them uh, to the resistant groups of Belgian soldiers. It was not that, or, or they were communists or not, it was absolutely not important. 
because uh, the resistance was coordinated uh, uh, from um, uh, Great Britain and um, America. So um, it was not a Soviet uh, um, resistance, it was Belgian resistance. And they participated there together with uh, soldiers from Poland, uh, from um, other countries occupied uh, of Germany. But in the Netherlands, the situa uh, situation was absolutely different. Uh, Netherlands resistance, uh, it was sabotage. It was not a resistance. And so they don't, uh, didn't uh, fight uh, there. They were in camps and were killed in camps. And were buried in the Netherlands uh, as unknown soldiers. And our partner from the Netherlands, Remco Riding, um, he uh, does a very great work. Uh, he works with uh, different research groups in Russia, in other countries, in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzia, in ex-Soviet republics. And uh, we now start together a project. It's for school children. Um, it's uh, um, uh, the world wars. Uh, the title is uh, The History of World Wars to make uh, children acquainted with the past of uh, their great parents, great, great parents. So we are working with schools, not only from Moscow, but for uh, different regions of Russia. And he works in the Netherlands with schools from Amersfoort region. And we will uh, bring these schools together, these children together, and uh, they will together recover the story of these forgotten soldiers. So it's not ideological project. And uh, we are not interested in ideology of these soldiers, but we are interested in their tragic uh, lives and tragic uh, deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And just following also the topic, there was a question from uh, Julien. Uh, would you like uh, me to read it? I guess. So uh, how do you perceive the fact that the crucial role played by the USSR against Nazi Germany is largely undermined in Belgium? Um, I was in Belgium in October of uh, 2019, uh, yes, the year before pandemic, and we have very, uh, we had very great plans for our cooperation, but I still hope that uh, I will come um, to Belgium once more, but uh, in Belgium there are different people, and you see, I have told that we are a research center, we are not political center, we are not, uh, we are uh, not um, busy with po po policy of, uh, um, we, are busy, uh, we are busy with humanitarian dialogue between people. And yes, there are different people in Russia also, and there are different people in Belgium. And, uh, but all people that I have met in Ardenne in uh, Belgium were very friendly, were uh, very open. Were, um, I, I didn't meet anyone uh, who tried to undermine the role of Soviet soldiers in uh, uh, the Second World War. Uh, it's true. Maybe Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your uh, for your answer. And then uh, also following the work of the center, there is a question uh, by uh, Augustine. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been really, really interesting. Well, I had a question uh, to Anna about uh, if you had any numbers about uh, the numbers of participants that the center, your center, has attracted over the recent years. And I had a second question, which you partly answered it, because when you said that, oh, you, you had this interest in Russia about the Dutch language and Belgium, I was like, really? That was very strange, because uh, that's really strange to, underst to understand that. But, but so, yes, there's this story of, of Soviet soldiers that die in the battlefront in Belgium. But was there any 
other reason uh, to explain this uh, this story because I've been to America. Uh, there are also Americans that died in the Bataille des Ardennes, and uh, none of them even know that Belgium is a country. Uh, they even think that it's part of Germany uh, for a reason I don't I don't get. So it's it's interesting to know that Russian people are are that interest about uh, history and geography, which is really fascinating. So, thank you well. <laughs> thank you well, Oak. Uh, so, okay, uh, first of all, I'll answer about uh, the number of participants. So, uh, I guess uh, in Russia at the moment, there are about 100 students who study the, the Dutch language. Uh, so, of course, I do not count the uh, amount, like the number of people who have already, go, who has already graduated, because like in general, I think uh, there is, there are people, yeah. In, and uh, actually, the question you that you have asked, so why do the Russian uh, people learn Dutch is being asked uh, to me every time I get acquainted with a new audience. Uh, yeah, so actually why I started doing that, that is because it was a choice of my university. And so mainly people go uh, to study the Dutch language because of their university. So this is a given language to them. So they study that in order to work maybe in the future or something. So, uh, and uh, other people learn the Dutch language for other reasons, for moving to the Netherlands, for example, and so we all know about that. Uh, so about the um, students of uh, the Benelux region, for example, who are engaged in our projects, there are about, I guess, 20 of them at the moment. So mostly they are uh, my friends uh, So who have uh, who, who have ever come to Benelux Center or who, or who I got acquainted with uh, once. And so, and they're friends, so friends of friends. And yes, this is such a chain. Uh, and yeah, we are really are looking forward to broaden so one one day uh, the audience but now yeah we have what we have but still it's really nice to see them all on our speaking clubs yes and it's super gezellig uh, I would say uh, yes and so I think about uh, your question uh, concerning the um, so why the Russians uh, like care so much about the perished um, soldiers I would address that question to Maria because she like delved in that project so much I think she knows better about that than me so Maria if it's fine for you to answer um, yes I'll try um, you see um, uh, I studied Dutch language in Soviet Union and in this uh, in this time I didn't know where the Netherlands um, uh, were uh, but uh, then when the um, uh, uh, when we have a, uh, ha, ha, uh, when we got opportunity to travel, I uh, visited the Netherlands and um, Belgium, and uh, it was very nice uh, for me and for people that I uh, could speak Dutch. And then I have worked for ten years for Dutch um, uh, firm in uh, Russia. I was director for uh, um, Russia. And so uh, we need we needed this uh, language, Dutch language, to communicate uh, with um, our colleagues, Dutch colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody speaks English, but it's uh, English is not the native language language uh, for the Dutch people, and they uh, appreciate it if you speak uh, with them their language. It uh, creates such sphere. Uh, people um, understand each other better. Uh, the same situation is if Russian people um, hear that uh, somebody speaks Russian in the Netherlands or in Belgium. I think uh, who more languages you learn, who uh, better you understand the other people, uh, the history of these countries. Uh, uh, then you can read books, uh, you can... Uh, got acquainted with literature uh, and uh, the Netherlands and the Belgium have very interesting history uh, with uh, first of all Belgium have very interesting uh, uh, history and now we and Anna we uh, study uh, French language uh, because Belgium is the country of three languages and who more languages who better, uh, I think it's my opinion, to understand each other 
who may not uh, speak only English. It's mm -hmm. not enough. Yeah, there is, there is also I... a question from uh, uh, Ronald. Uh, he was uh, asking if uh, some people study Russian because of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and if we study Rus uh, sorry, uh, Belgian languages because of uh, Charles de Coster or Beers, <laughs> what would you comment? Uh, uh, yes, I think that there are people who study Russian languages for Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. I met such people in the Netherlands where I studied uh, for the uh, um, uh, courses for Dutch uh, language teachers, uh, extra muras. But I think uh, most of people uh, study language for more practical um, reasons, for friends, for family, uh, for um, maybe uh, girlfriends, boyfriends. Uh, and uh, you uh, feel uh, mm, it's a uh, zone feeling if you are in the country and you understand uh, the language of this country. Uh, we are traveling very much now, and it's very nice to speak to people not in, uh, not always in English, but also the language of the country. It's my opinion uh, that we must study languages, and then we can uh, understand each other better, and then we can solve problems that we have. English is not uh, the native language for Belgium, for the Netherlands. Uh, so maybe we will understand each other if uh, uh, you study Russian language and we study French, Dutch, German, English, then it will be much easier for everything. For yeah, everything. Th thank you so much. Uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Kaltum, please. Um, yes, hello. Well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, like the little history uh, facts and stuff. It's very interesting. Uh, so uh, today I represent the Comité Diplomatique. It's a young, it's an association of young uh, students and young professionals in diplomacy. And we received a lot of message now when we, you were talking about where can we find you? How do, can we do to participate in the speaking uh, Russian speaking groups and stuff? So if, if possible, maybe Anna, uh, if she can write in the main discussion links, how to participate, what are the criteria, uh, what are the levels needed so that we can, of course, learn the language and have a better communication. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for your question. And Anna is my assistant, and Anna is responsible for all our contacts in social networks. So I give word to Anna. Yeah, of course. We have actually no limits, so we welcome everyone who is interested in us and who is interested in participation. So, uh, yeah, everyone is welcome. I'll send a link now so to the group chat after the questions, and you may follow us in all our uh, like social networks we have. So we are looking forward to seeing you all, no matter what level you have. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you very much uh, for the comments. Uh, uh, if uh, there are uh, some other questions to the Benelux Center, we will uh, uh, continue. And I would like to uh, come back uh, to the chamber. There is another question from uh, Alessandra about the, uh, as we call it in Russia, reunification of uh, Crimea with Russia and if it influenced uh, our relations with other countries. I don't know if uh, Artem, you would like to comment this, uh, or is something you want I, to I, ask the question? Yeah, actually, let me comment very brief on that. Um, since I represent the economic institution, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, once again, as it has been noted before, uh, we're trying our best to stand aside from politics and religion. I believe. Uh, Maybe if there are some people who are uh, native Belgian, they, they might understand this kind of um, language clash. Uh, we try to abstain from any differences in politics, religion, and language, and uh, try to be as unbiased as it can be. And once again, since we are an economic entity, uh, we are the Chamber of Commerce, and we're not a political institution engaged in any kind of uh, policy making or politics and activity related to this sphere, I believe it would be 
not really uh, up to the point if I would address this question. Um, I, I believe that you can do your research on that and uh, see a lot on how the, the relations with the European Union developed in the last 10, 20, 15 years to see how it all happened. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Sandra. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, but I, I, I would just uh, ask uh, if uh, also in the economical field, uh, the restrictions, uh, we call them restrictions, actually not sanctions, uh, by uh, the European Union, Union if they uh, became a problem for Russian-Belgian economical cooperation, or there, there are still ways to to, 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 to provide smooth uh, contacts. Right, Lucan, yeah. Um, as I've noted uh, before, in 2013, there has been a downsurge uh, in the number of contacts and the economic cooperation level. But uh, since then, this has been like a shock therapy, really, for the relations between Belgium and Russia. And after this shock, uh, it has taken some time for some of the companies uh, whose activities were related to uh, some of the th spheres uh, which fell under restrictions, it took some time for them to withdraw smoothly. It has taken uh, approximately two years for them, especially for the companies in agriculture, uh, to withdraw from Russia. And um, then uh, after some time, there has been an upsurge and the, 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 the returning of some of the Belgian businesses back to Russia. For instance, um, some of the chocolate companies came to Russia very recently uh, and they're developing really great. There has been this year several cafe, cafes and restaurants opened in Russia by the Belgian businessmen um, who are offering best uh, level and best service cuisine imaginable. Uh, from Belgium to the Russian market. Um, and I believe there is still like the space for cooperation and for improvement in this sense. Uh, <clears throat> but this has affected, once again, the restrictions, they have affected mostly the service sector and the, the agriculture and food sector, uh, while all the technological and industrial uh, cooperations and contacts, they remained in place. And um, they, they have, in fact, expanded a lot over the last uh, six years, as we see it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the comment. Uh, and um, yes, indeed. And I, I, I actually, just what uh, also came to, to my mind, uh, there was uh, Leonidas uh, maybe uh, opened uh, some years ago, and then they were closed. That's what I, I saw as observer. Uh, but uh, there is still a very good uh, Belgian uh, restaurant in, in Moscow, <laughs> something. And in St. Peter, they're expanding greatly. And yeah. in St. Petersburg, yeah. We have the mannequin piece in, in Moscow in many places, for instance, this, you can try some very good waffle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, actually, uh, talking about uh, uh, mannequin piece, I also would like uh, to tell you a bit uh, about some uh, cultural programs that uh, we have uh, between uh, Russia and uh, Belgium, uh, as we are a um, Russian house uh, and we are about culture and science. Uh, actually, unfortunately, due to pandemic reasons, we had to postpone a very great uh, ceremony. Uh, we were supposed to, to put uh, the uh, Russian costume on the mannequin piece. Uh, actually, it already happened before. And uh, uh, it, we, we were supposed to do it in autumn uh, due to the big uh, festival Russian seasons that had uh, place, um, that took place uh, in Belgium last year. But only virtually, unfortunately. So uh, we postponed it uh, and uh, we were planning to organize it in May this year, uh, but probably we will do it in June because 12 June we celebrate uh, Russia Day and um, we are uh, in um, waiting actually that the situation should be better uh, with the coronavirus. So we will be able to organize uh, some events. 
And uh, exactly, uh, I've mentioned uh, already uh, last year was a very big, uh, was supposed to be very big uh, uh, festival in uh, Belgium uh, with a big cultural consortium, uh, Russian Seasons. Uh, there were supposed to be uh, performances by the best uh, opera singers like Anna Netrebko uh, in Belgium, uh, many uh, different ballet, uh, not only from uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, but also from uh, regions that are very unique and uh, very uh, nice. Uh, they were supposed to come to Belgium, but now, uh, now it's uh, postponed. And another scene that uh, actually uh, we were also negotiating uh, with the uh, Belgian government. Uh, in uh, Brussels, there is a very big uh, uh, also festival, Omegang, and uh, Russia uh, was supposed uh, to be uh, the honorable guest because there is uh, always uh, uh, invited guest of this big festival. Uh, so uh, this year and la last year, from last year, it was postponed to this year. Uh, this year, they already announced that this festival is going to be also online. So, but we are still uh, looking for. And uh, beside this, uh, of course, uh, there are many events that take place right now online by our Russian uh, sent, uh, Russian house. Uh, and uh, besides uh, online events, uh, there is also a language school. Uh, we teach Russian, but also we uh, teach uh, French and Dutch, but for uh, Russian speaking people who live here in Belgium. So you yeah, are very welcome to, to visit uh, the center. Uh, as uh, uh, at the beginning, um, Vera Bunina, she mentioned, uh, we would be very happy to see you uh, uh, in the Russian house here in Brussels after the pandemic. And we really hope uh, that it will finish soon. Unfortunately, right now there are restrictions that we can um, uh, invite only uh, 10 people. Uh, but uh, due to the fact that there are also some uh, people who work in the center right now, uh, it's not unfortunately possible to do it. But we will hope, we will hope. Uh, and uh, in um, another uh, project, it's uh, Russian-Belgian and also uh, Russian-European. Uh, there is a big uh, European uh, space uh, center uh, not agency center in, in Belgium. And uh, 12 April uh, to celebrate the 60th uh, anniversary uh, of the first flight of the man to space. Uh, there is going to be an opening uh, ceremony of a special uh, Gagarin Hall. Uh, so uh, after uh, you will be able also to, to visit this uh, center and there is going to be uh, lots of, there are going to be lots of documentaries and uh, interesting uh, artifacts about uh, space uh, uh, and uh, especially the involvement uh, uh, of Russia and um, about the first flight uh, of Gagarin. Um, that's uh, actually, that's it. Uh, if to speak about uh, also um, a bit cultural cooperation. Um, Artom, uh, are you still uh, with us? Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, okay, then uh, that's to know. And I uh, actually also um, have a question to our uh, big partner of this uh, project, uh, Comité Diplomatique uh, from uh, the university. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, uh, what is your interest uh, in, in Russia and uh, maybe um, your and uh, also some other participants because we have uh, uh, some people who are coming from other organizations and universities uh, so what was the, the the idea and why did you why was our proposal and <laughs> also interesting for you um, well, first of all, it was indeed a very interesting proposal, but um, as I highlight, highlighted, highlighted it before, this is a very difficult word. Mm -hmm. um, 
in in Belgium, uh, and maybe it, it would be very nice if now any everyone could talk about it because I think we all approximately live in Belgium or at least have a link with it. But I I've seen many students who are very much questioning themselves or like questioning about Russia, Russian foreign policy. We see a lot of things happening in the media. Uh, we want to see, we want to learn, we want to discover uh, what's behind the big country. And um, unfortunately in Belgium, we don't really have a university level, I'm speaking, uh, a lot of uh, insights. Uh, sometimes it is very much academic. We learn about a lot about the past, but not very much about the present. So of course, uh, with this uh, uh, training that now we have this week, it is just amazing because we can learn a lot about foreign policy. We spoke earlier about public diplomacy, now about the past and also history. And so uh, it gives us a lot of insights. And I think it is very much needed because we try to give also a training to maybe future Belgian diplomats. And um, we enter a, a bit like a new era where uh, diplomats have to be trained from the very young age, let's say, and also have a lot of things. We cannot be just like the Belgian diplomat who only likes Belgium and sells Belgium, no. This diplomat has to be interested in all the languages in all the countries. So that's why it is very much very nice to have all of these informations and to, to know also because I think um, is it Augustin who said it earlier, but it's not that it's undermined in Belgium, but sometimes maybe with the a bit of image or stuff, but we tend to think that it's thanks to the US that Belgium was released, but no, it was more thanks to Russia and all of these things uh, that play in this uh, thing. So I don't know if anyone wants to also say why in Belgium we should be more interested in Russia, but from our side, it is very much needed because it is a very interesting uh, country. So voila, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much uh, for your answer. Uh, if uh, anybody would like to add something. Well, I think that Kaltum had already a very well thought out an answer, so I'm not going to elaborate that much longer. But um, just that, yeah, um, I think a lot of people, my generation, uh, is very much interested to know more about Russia uh, beyond the cliches, beyond the stereotypes. And um, because we, we, we share a lot of values together, we and I talked about the uh, fallen soldiers on the battlefield, but that tells you something that uh, uh, Soviet soldiers who could have just resisted the Nazis, but just uh, just helped defeat the Nazis. And uh, I think we share more things that uh, in our current uh, media ecosystem, we, 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 think, uh, we think we do, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Just, just to also to uh, underline one interesting fact about uh, Belgium and why it's uh, interesting uh, for Russian culture also. Uh, actually, before uh, the very uh, famous uh, uh, place as Nice was open in France, uh, where uh, lots of uh, Russian people traveled at the end of 19th and 20th century. Before, another very famous place was exactly in Belgium, and it was Astenda. And uh, there are uh, even uh, some, um, we, we can even uh, find some parts in our literature describing uh, Russian people who were traveling to Ostend to, uh, to have sea, uh, to, uh, to have some vacations there. Uh, so um, this is also how it works and uh, how uh, the cultures are interconnected. Or one of the first uh, trams in Russia were, were coming exactly from uh, Belgian companies. So uh, this is also a very uh, interesting uh, fact. And uh, not maybe everybody uh, knows that the, the uh, first uh, uh, king, uh, Leopold I, uh, actually uh, before, uh, once uh, due to uh, the war with Napoleon, he was the Russian general. Uh, that time it was very common that uh, actually uh, people, uh, different countries were exchanging also uh, military school. Uh, so uh, that's it. And uh, here in the, uh, in the Royal Museum, 
uh, of history in Brussels. Uh, there are famous, um, uh, one of the famous portraits, the same as we have in Hermitage, in the gallery of uh, uh, Russian uh, generals, uh, where there is a honorable place also of Leopold I. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is how it works. And uh, I just would like also to address one question to Artyom, speaking a bit more about uh, uh, present. Uh, how do you see, what are the perspective also uh, fields of uh, future cooperation? And maybe if you could uh, tell us uh, some secrets about uh, great uh, expectations and great plans that uh, one's chamber would like uh, to uh, achieve and uh, to implement uh, in, in which uh, fields of Russian-Belgian cooperation. Right, yeah. Um, so throughout my presentation, I've spoken about the special council that has been established within the trade chamber, within the chamber of commerce uh, that assists only not only Belgian, but also uh, Russian and Luxembourgish businesses uh, with, uh, with the legal and with any kind of advice um, in terms of the development of sustainable, uh, sustainable solutions, sustainable future, uh, including the sectors of energy and, and any kind of supply chain logistics here. So the, I, I believe the general idea of cooperation is that, and the general goal is just to unite the efforts because the more efforts are there from from the side of the business uh from the side of the funds and other non-profit organization uh, organizations that kind of align their interest with the chamber of commerce uh the more authority there is for the chamber of commerce to uh, to develop to to develop their interests and propagate their interests the interests of its members um so yeah the general idea for, for, for the success, for the subsequent success is to unite the efforts and invite more businesses. And once again, as we have spoken throughout this uh, workshop today, the, the opportunities for development are, they're just numerous and they're endless and they just need uh, the, the, the effort on both sides. Um, so I believe, yeah, th th this is all from me uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, just uh, another question, uh, actually about uh, nuclear power, right. uh, because uh, as uh, far as uh, I, I know, uh, in, in Belgium, there is a program to um, eliminate all uh, power plants. And like actually, Germany. Yeah. Yeah, at the same time for Russia, it's so uh, uh, one of the uh, development, uh, very uh, fast developing uh, field. Uh, so uh, do you have any uh, connections also in this topic or uh, they're, they're, they're just not discussed uh, at the Russian-Belgian level? Right, yeah, so um, I believe that the, 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 the technologies of such scale, the, the nuclear technologies there, uh, rather coordinated on a different level other than the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this is why I'm not really capable of providing you any insight. Don't it's you have a small power plant? <laughs> well, I wish I could. I wish I could actually have one, but yeah, um, of, of course not. Um, and the the reality is that with this, uh, with this gradual dismantlement of uh, nuclear power facilities taking place uh, in some of the European countries, um, not all Russian companies are going to be affected. Uh, of course, it's going to affect such companies, Ross Atom, Ross Atom. We, we know that they have their interest and their stake in this area. But at the same time, there are many, many companies who are, um, who are interested in sustainable development also in Russia, who are interested in the development of uh, hydrogen power. Ros Atom also has a stake in the development of hydrogen power, which it could uh, later offer instead um, instead of the nuclear power. So there is still a lot of room for cooperation and uh, it is not as harmful um, because some other European countries such as France, they're not as fast in um, eliminating nuclear power plants. Instead, they're actually uh, planning to build some of the facilities still 
and um, some other states are also European Union states are also eager to do so. So it's not as um, as as negative as it could be uh, seen from the first glance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, actually, uh, just because we are uh, already mostly coming uh, to, to the end of this session, uh, if Anna, you would like also to share with us something? Uh, actually, I uh, would really like to answer the question which was addressed to me, uh, which we a little bit, uh, yeah, didn't answer. Uh, so it was a, a question, why do the Russian people, uh, uh, why they preserve this memory of uh, the soldiers who perished uh, on the territory of the Sek of uh, so the Netherlands and yeah, on the territory of uh, the Benelux countries. Uh, so I think that, for example, in my family, in my personal family, so uh, I have two grandparents who perished uh, during the Second World War, and uh, it's not like I'm being taught from the very childhood uh, to remember them, to remember the, uh, what heroes they were, but it's also like uh, this is within our culture, so because we... Um, we really know about those heroes. We really remember about them. And it's really important for us to also know about their history. And that is why we're trying to uh, do that, like uh, to honor them as much as we can. So, uh, and that actually also means uh, remembering about those who perished on the territory of the Netherlands also. Uh, I cannot answer about the Americans. I mean, uh, unfortunately, this is not uh, within my competence, but I think that, yeah, so I really hope that I answered eventually this question. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's it, I guess. So what I wanted to to add. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your answer, for your comment. Uh, ah, there is a, a question from Ronald. Yes, uh, OK. Excuse me, Artem, I wanted to ask you, like I have seen uh, recently where uh, the Luxembourg has gotten a very unexpected interest in space technology. They have a new master in the university. They have a, they have been, they are invested in the startups. So I wonder why this sudden interest in space? I even uh, put you the link of this uh, actually promoted by the Luxembourg government is their program Space Tech. And also I would say Russia would have a lot to propose in that regard, right? Right. Um, thank you for your question, Ronald. Um, I cannot answer on behalf of the national interest of Luxembourg since I represent uh, the completely different organization. But speaking of, uh, of actually why Luxembourg um, surprisingly invests in such areas, uh, the partial reason for that is that Luxembourg is the capital of the European Union finance. It is the financial capital of Europe. Um, of course, we know that there is London, but uh, after Brexit and uh, overall, uh, Luxembourg has a lot of funds and funding, and they need to redistribute this money um, just to have the positive returns. And in this, in this sense, uh, Russian companies uh, have a lot of faith uh, to entrust. Um, for, for many years, uh, Russia has been in, at, at, on the forefront in terms of space technology and other high-tech areas. Um, it, and in this sense, I believe it, it should be of no surprise to see that Luxembourg invest in, in, in space. Um, and well, you see space engineering, just the spheres, it, it should be of no surprise. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I would like uh, to uh, thank all our uh, experts uh, for a very interesting meeting. I hope you really found uh, interesting also contacts uh, to develop future cooperation to study languages or uh, maybe uh, to develop also trade. Why not? Uh, diplomacy and uh, trade, they're always uh, uh, going uh, nearby. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, to tell you about tomorrow. Uh, so tomorrow we uh, start at uh, two, 
Uh, I would like uh, to ask you also to register a bit in advance because there is a waiting room and uh, we have to, it takes time for us to, um, to let everybody uh, enter Zoom. Uh, so we have uh, one um, meeting uh, about uh, digital diplomacy with uh, Oleg uh, Shakirov. He is uh, the expert of uh, Peer uh, Center. Uh, Peer Center is a, a very big uh, think tank in Russia that is uh, focusing uh, on uh, uh, exactly uh, uh, security. And uh, one of the focus is on uh, cyber security. Uh, so this is why actually he is uh, doing uh, lots of research in this field uh, and especially about uh, digital uh, uh, digitalization is uh, always uh, going nearby um, uh, cyber security as well. Uh, so uh, he will analyze the work uh, of our um, foreign office uh, and uh, how it works and uh, where we are going in this uh, field. Then uh, we have a meeting with uh, Natalia Burlinova. We will speak actually about uh, uh, also public diplomacy, about Russian public diplomacy. Um, I'm not sure if you had a common picture after our first meeting, actually, how exactly our public diplomacy in Russia is structured. Uh, I just would like uh, to mention uh, that we have uh, two uh, big um, uh, players, I would say like this, in 2010 were established Garchikov Foundation with uh, whom we have meeting on Thursday. Uh, this is uh, the foundation that actually supports and uh, give, uh, gives grants to different uh, NGOs in Russia to develop international cooperation. And beside this, they also have their own uh, different educational seminars, schools, uh, and so on. And uh, another one uh, big uh, player that supports public diplomacy uh, in Russia is uh, uh, Russian Council on uh, International Affairs. And it also was this, uh, established in 2010. Uh, after this, uh, there were uh, many other uh, institutions that were uh, appeared uh, in Russia. And actually, as also Professor Zonova said, um, right now the um, field of uh, public diplomacy in Russia is very diverse. Uh, but uh, there are two differences. There is public diplomacy that has support uh, from the state, uh, and uh, there are some uh, independent uh, actors that are uh, like also universities or different other NGOs uh, that are um, participating in international uh, cooperation. And also it depends uh, uh, what kind of financial support do they have? Uh, so beside this uh, Gorchikov Foundation, uh, then they were uh, created also some other tools. And about them, uh, Natalia Burinova will tell you more uh, details. And uh, also uh, she will, uh, they, they, they wrote an interesting manual. Uh, exactly the name is 10 steps of uh, uh, efficient public diplomacy. So uh, uh, we will be able to speak about this. And after we have a meeting with uh, Alek Barabanov, who is um, a program director of Valdai Discussion Club. Uh, I don't know if you've heard before about this uh, platform, but uh, uh, it's really uh, one of uh, the top expert, uh, uh, very senior uh, discussion club, uh, where also the presidents of different countries are uh, participating. And uh, so they do research, they do different uh, discussions uh, and so on. Uh, and at the same time, he is representative of Ngimo University. In Ngimo, there is a special institute on uh, uh, European uh, affairs. Uh, and the name of this university, uh, institute is European Studies Institute 
at Gimo University. Uh, Alek Barabanov is a very famous media also um, expert. So, uh, he usually participates in different uh, uh, TV shows. So maybe uh, some of you could uh, uh, see him commenting something. Uh, and um, so he will focus exactly on Russia-EU relations, uh, not only uh, EU, but also Council of Europe uh, relations. So you're very welcome to ask uh, any questions. So uh, that's it. I thank you very much for the first uh, day. Uh, I hope you liked it. I hope it was interesting. And uh, we are looking forward to meeting you tomorrow and uh, wishing you a very good evening. Thank you. Uh, but Lukiana, there is a question in the for the Zoom link. Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. Yes, we are with the same. Uh, we are with the same Zoom link. Yes, Perfect. we don't. We don't change it. See you tomorrow, and thank you for today. It was very interesting. Yes, thank you. And if you have any other question, please uh, write us on email, WhatsApp, or whatever you want. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. See you. Thank. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you.